You're listening to the New Artist Workshop. Hitler made mistakes, and with this, I will correct them all. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. your favorite podcast now that's what i call a franchise i'm peter mancuso and i'm viviana metzger and this is the show where peter and i pick a film franchise and go through every single installment the good the bad and the ugly but today we're doing something a little different this is one of our bonus episodes where we take a look at there'll be no cheering oh sorry (laughs) this is serious this is one of our bonus episodes where we take a look at any franchise films that we didn't talk about because it came out after we covered that franchise or we didn't know that it existed, or for any other reason, right? So, Viviana, what are we talking about today? All right, so today we are talking about the 2023 film Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And this is your one and only spoiler warning. So if you haven't watched the movie, go do that before listening to this episode. It kind of sucks, but also it, I mean, maybe it doesn't suck. But if if my memory serves me right, we finished covering Indiana Jones, like, right before this came out. Like, our last episode of Indiana Jones was, like, late May or early June. Yeah. I think. And this came out the end of June, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was, like, a month or two. It was was not long after. But it was funny because we were recording these episodes well in advance. that, That was the issue, is that it wasn't, like, even soon to coming out. Because no, we yeah. recorded them, like, we recorded those episodes in, like, the fall of 2022, like, almost six months before. Yeah, we, we would have had to wait for a long time. Yeah. If I remember, um, okay, hold on. I'm going to stop what I'm saying, because maybe I just wrote in the outline, <laughs> our share Google Doc. She added a bullet for Peter's weird thoughts. I'm just giving context. <laughs> Um, but I remember when we, after the blurb. I remember when we recorded our last episode of Indiana Jones, which of course is our franchise retrospective we do each season, of course. where we talk about the season, uh, the franchise as a whole, where we think maybe it could go in the future. It was like it wasn't. Lo- I remember we were talking about how they were gonna release the trailer soon. Yes. At that point, but we didn't know the name of the movie yet. Yes, yes, yes. Like we literally, didn't know but anything. they had announced like on this date we're gonna drop a trailer for it. Yeah. But we were like, I wonder what it's going to be and, and everything. So cause yeah. we didn't really know anything about the movie at all. We didn't know the name. We didn't know what it was going to be about. We knew nothing. Yeah. And then when, when they did release some stuff, it was literally like that one clip of him on a horse and like the Dial of Destiny. And that yeah. was it. <laughs> um, and then like the one scene like in the in the hotel. Like those are. Oh, there's a trailer. It was like a oh, full trailer. Those are like the only two scenes that I saw like oh maybe i don't know maybe i never i don't know well you or maybe, i remember seeing but i someone i i did hear through the grapevine you have seen the letterbox blurb <laughs> so maybe you could read that for us well, i haven't read it. it before but you know there's a first time for everything yeah all right here's the letterboxed blurb Finding himself in a new era, approaching retirement, Indy wrestles with fitting into a world that seems to have outgrown him. But as the... Tentacles? Okay. (laughs) That's right. But as the tentacles, he is. He is. like, is that testicles or tentacles? The the testicles! (laughs) I was confused. Okay. (laughs) But as the tentacles of an (laughs) all-too... At the testicles of an all-too-familiar evil. I saw it, and I was going up to it, and I was a little nervous. Okay. But as the tentacles of an all-too-familiar evil return in the form of an old rival, Indy must don his hat and pick up his whip once more to make sure an ancient and powerful artifact doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Very meaty letterbox blurb. Yes. Um, And we'll kind of talk about if... Like, it's something that really stuck out to me here is the line, Indy wrestles with fitting into a world that seems to have outgrown him. (laughs) That was like the best stuff in this movie, but it's not really a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Which I thought it was going to be. What are you talking about? Like Like, this idea of like Indiana Jones, like... like, And his house, like... No, I'm saying like in terms of like, 
We, I mean, we talked about this. So what we should have done is re-listen to our, if nothing else, our, our retrospective Yeah, episode. I was going to say we should have done <laughs> To see what we said. Yeah. But if I'm not mistaken, my, my kind of like broad analysis of the whole thing, which I try to do each time, like what, what is this whole thing about? Mm-hmm. If my memory serves me right, my kind of argument was that Indiana Jones or the stories of Indiana Jones are really about this tug and pull between... Uh, what is history and history's uh, memorabilia, for lack of a better word? Like, like mm-hmm. the things that, like, what are they for? Gotcha. Are they for your own personal benefit or for a better understanding of of who we are today? Well, and, yeah, and wouldn't, then, it, wouldn't it be that? But I'm saying that the films are always about this tug and pull, like between like the the like the more noble aspects of archaeology versus like grave digging, essentially, right? And yeah, they talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this movie, very briefly, every so often, is wrestling with, even if not like those ideas, but just like this idea of like, is there a place in 1969 for a person, like if Indiana Jones was a real person, mm-hmm. this like kind of swashbuckling kind of, <laughs> like, like is there is there room for this anymore? And maybe this would have made it more know. like woke, but again, like the things that the movies have never really tried to explore this one kind of maybe unless unless it was something we said as a joke or if they said but like Another. the idea of he's just like an old white guy stealing stuff from like brown community like no, historical yeah. communities right no, yeah, but the films it's... never address that because it's a different era in the 80s when they're making it, these movies so yeah I, I don't think it addresses that like head on necessarily um like to what I remember maybe it does like maybe I'll remember something later but like I was surprised that it definitely was, well, I guess I'm not super surprised, but, like, it, it was more woke than, like, I thought it was going to be. And um, I don't say that pejoratively. But, no, but just, like, like... I'm woke, I guess, but, like... No, yeah, we're... We're like, just using that we're, word. I'm li- not... We're liberal people, but obviously you can, like, tell the difference, right? Yeah. So, like, something that stuck out to me was when, um... Oh, I don't even know her name. What's her name? Alexandra? No. The the Phoebe Waller Bridge's character? Yeah. What is her character? Miss Shaw. <laughs> yeah. What's her first name? <laughs> Miss Shaw. Wombat, Wombat is Wombat. her nickname. Wombat. Shit, what what is her name? Wombat. <laughs> what is her name? I, oh, I can't believe I don't remember that. And again, we we only watched this yesterday. <laughs> Let me see. Uh Helena. Helena. Helena, yes. But I don't like when they say Helen. I, I prefer Helena. I wish they just said Helena. Because that sounds like a name. Whereas Helena just sounds like you're saying Helen, but then you just add another part at the end. No, Helena is like, the it's like a Greek name. Yeah. Like, like from ancient Greece. Anyways, <clears throat> like I'm pretty sure there's like yes, some yes, in Greece mythology. Anyways, but when she first approaches him in the bar and he doesn't recognize her and he's like, um, he's like, oh, whatever I did to you, I'm sorry. Like, I was like, oop. Because it kind of like, because I was like, oop, because, um, you know, with all the stuff, right, the, the Me Too and whatnot, but then like his relationship with Marion and then always he's like with lady, you know, he's always been like a, a, a ladies man or whatever. Yes. So I, I heard that and interpreted like, oop, mm. like, you know, he's, he's finally having to. Well, I guess he's not finally having to, but it, it's being addressed a little bit that, like, you know, yeah. his his former behavior with women may not have been the most yeah. appropriate. <laughs> that, that's I didn't pick. I think that also, I, I think that speaks to the obvious difference because, like, you're a woman, and I'm a, a man. Like, I didn't go there. I yeah. I, I just kind of uh, interpreted that as just, he's just like a cantankerous, not agreeable person. But you're. But that may you might be more correct on that. But in any case, well, I think if a if a random young lady walks up to him in a bar, I mean, what what else could he be apologizing? And as we for? know, he yeah. has a history of having affairs with younger women. <laughs> yes. Sometimes below the age of consent, and as we learned. Sometimes in the first one. Wait, was she? Well, she, she was a triple. She was a triple agent, right? The blonde lady. She was. No, she was about... a Nazi pretending to be a, an American. No. You're talking about the third one. I'm I know. talking about Marion. I know the first you're. Ta- I know you're talking about Marion. I think she was a normal age. Well, I was just gonna say, and even Nazis. Blo- yeah, but Nazi. Yeah, but he didn't know that. 
Well, at the time, yes. At the time. But, but yeah, so Marion, that was something that we looked into, right? And even even the team, like George and... and George Lucas <laughs> wanted it to be, like, very explicit. Like, she was 12 and he was, like, 25. And they were like, what? Why? <laughs> I, I, don't, we, we I couldn't begin to, to know. We need to find a, a, an interview or something about that. Because that's... So specific. I'm and sure so his strange. argument would maybe be like because it says something about the character. Like it's not like he would be approving of that, but just that like that's something this character would do. I, guess I don't know. So. But even then, no. But even in the revised version, the <laughs> way they frame it, she was probably at the very least a teenager when he was like a grown man. Yeah. When well, they which, first start an affair, like however long ago which, before the first, which one. like kind of makes sense with the whole. Um, you know, when you're first kind of introduced to him in, in I don't know, regular life or whatever. When he's a professor. Like, like yeah, like, like, like the girls, yeah, are like all, you know, even even the guys, they're like all swooning after him. She has the I love you. The on guys her. are swooning after him? What are you talking there about? There was a guy who was, yeah. He had a gay student? Yes! I didn't notice that. In the 40s. Um, but, yeah, and then she had like the I love you on her yeah. eye, eyelids or whatever. So it's like, you know. Mm-hmm. Such a random inclusion in these movies. <laughs> anyway, but but you bring up this point where it's like, okay, the movie isn't quite wrestling with like me too, but but like what's going on in sixty nine among many things is like the women's liberation movement, right? Yeah. So I think it like kind of tangentially oh, that... explore explores oh, <laughs> like, um, you know, like. I feel like the fourth one did a better job than this mm-hmm. of feeling like it's the late 50s. Mm-hmm. In terms of, like, it's been 20 years both for us as the viewers as well as the characters, <laughs> yeah. roughly. And 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 the story logically kind of goes in a direction that would make sense historically. So it's like, yeah. of course, Indiana Jones would kind of become, like, a pseudo-CIA-adjacent Kind of, yeah, like not CIA, but like during the war, he was doing like OSS stuff, like which yeah, is like, like the precursor of the CIA yeah. kind of intelligence stuff. Like, like he's not so, ancient language, he's not like storming the beaches on D Day, he's yeah. like infiltrating different, you oh, know what yeah, I mean? like, that too, yeah. right? Um, this one I feel like didn't, didn't uh, do the same legwork to kind of like. Where would he historically naturally be in 1969? Just a professor at Hunter? It's kind of like the same thing again. Yeah, yeah. he's just like a, still a professor. He's Which still. I, I was very confused because was it okay? I know he's from Utah. Maybe he didn't stay in Utah, and I know that. No, we never we, see him living in Utah. No, and I know we we looked up or I looked it up, and the college he taught at was like some nondescript, like maybe like Illinois or something. But, I thought it was more of like a Yale thing, like he was like in Connecticut. I don't know, but it wasn't it wasn't Brooklyn, it wasn't Manhattan. No, no, this so, is different. This is so, me. so I thought it was very strange that he just all of a sudden moved to New York in the sixties. Like, yeah, <laughs> like I just don't imagine like Indiana Jones living in New York City. Well, maybe they, maybe the like reason he's is because there. like maybe he was still in <laughs> Chicago wherever you want to say he was with Marion mm-hmm. but then when they start when they separate he then moves to New York I don't know I don't know like how long has he been in New York because like he's getting thrown a retirement party so clearly he's been there long enough where like they say a yeah. decade 10 years yeah so only a couple because the last so one took place in 1957 Marion might have left because no but they've have, they've only been separated for a little bit at this point no I know I'm saying like he didn't leave her like I think she might have left because she right she came in and was like oh there's no food in the house she was like familiar with the space yes yes you know um but my, my point being is that I wish it really like explored Indiana Jones in 1969 it has trappings of like but 1969 is a very pivotal like it uses it more as set dressing yeah, like it's, actually it's really using it all around. Yeah, it's like a donut, and then the story's in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> and and to be fair, I don't even know if the fourth one really wrestled with it. That was more just like kind of like the set. The setup is more historically I, it's never interesting. About that stuff, I don't yeah. think so. You know, but I wish it were. I wish it. it wish it explored. About what? Well, it says Indy wrestles with fitting into a world that seems to have outgrown him. I, I don't really know how. In what ways has it outgrown him? Well, Aside from just being, there's a difference between now being old and being in a world that has outgrown you. There's, there's, those are those are not mutually exclusive, but they are not the same thing. I don't know. I mean, what do you? Like, what does it mean so that it's 60, outgrown? Him? So, like, so, like, what? 
what do you th- think he'd be doing or where he would be? And I don't know. Beatlemania, Vietnam. No, 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 no. I'm, no, just, I'm just saying, like all these things, like civil rights movement, like like where where do you see him fitting in if not here? Like where? where I where I don't know. Him, you know, like, but I'm also not being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to come up with that. I know. I'm just. I'm just. <laughs> No but, you know, no, but I'm saying is I don't know. I don't really know. But all I know is, is that I don't know if this log line is accurate because I don't really see him wrestling with trying to fit into a world that seems to have outgrown him, is my point. Mm. That I don't know if the film really ever touches on any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, well, one thing I think they they also... He's very... To go, to go along with this is very old school, right? And I think that was one of the... Um, that was kind of like the main thing of the the fight scene in the hotel, right? He's got a whip, and everyone else has got like a semi-automatic. Like that, that is something that know. I yeah. <laughs> it's like, like you brought a knife to a gunfight. Kind yeah, of. or like yeah. he's riding a horse at, like in the subway, you know? Or like yeah. I, I think maybe just like technology. Like it would be cool Question to mark? see. It would be cool to see him. I think technology change to the times and adopt more. Like methods, mm-hmm. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I don't know. Like this is maybe like the really reductive, bad version of this idea. But like, he seems to like have no issue with Helena mm-hmm. as being like an active participant in the events of the story. Whereas you think someone of his generation no, would be he- a little bit more misogynistic. No, he's he's very much against all. <laughs> but it seems less 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 because he's misogynistic and of a certain generation, and more so because it's like he cares about her because she's like a surrogate daughter. Oh, oh. And oh. I feel like those are two yes, different things. Yes, 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 yes. Right. I'm not saying that we need to make him like a raging sexist. I'm just no, saying no, like no. that would be like one way you could do that. Well, that was another thing that I thought was. We haven't even done the basic info. It's okay. Oh. Calm down. No, I know. I'm calm. I'm just. Being <laughs> I listen. We're I'm I'm performing. This is an artifice for entertainment purposes. Your artifice is very loud, and I'm oh. trying to talk about character development. Anyway, okay, talk about character. So that was also something that I noticed with Helena because um, it it seemed it's almost like flipped because she's like very capitalistic and like she even like... mentions that, but like it feels like in this period of history, it's like the youth are like expanding their ideas of what are, what's possible. But I feel like she didn't represent that. Like, you gave her, like... Because at least with Mud, mm-hmm. he represented, like, that late 50s kind of, like, punk uh, vibe. Yeah. A worldview. Yeah. Of kind of, like, you know, which, like, which do whatever... I, like, I, I, I have issue with him sign, enlisting into the war. I, I feel like... You don't think that's in character? I, we, we know the reasons why they why they wrote it that way, but you're saying within the world of the story, like... Yeah, it how, kind of he's going to go from anti-establishment to, and, like, you know... Going to... Not only like, sign up for the military, but in like, one of the least yeah, morally I, justified wars like, ever. Act, like, actively. Like, he wasn't enlisted. Yeah. Like, he, he signed up, like, just to piss Indy off. That makes no sense. That's weird. But Shia... It wouldn't make more sense if he was drafted or something. Yeah, if he was drafted, then I don't know. But I guess that's to go with like his defiant like personality. It's like, in, in order to be defiant, I'm going to do something that's very conformist. Like what? It's, it's like it's like reverse. <laughs> it's like now it's like... Um, but again, that would have been interesting. Again... I don't think you build a whole movie around this, but it's like if he were drafted and then he gets killed in action, Indy has, um, you know, has been has been a student of history. Mm-hmm. Now he's living through it, mm-hmm. and he always had been. Mm-hmm. But this would be the first time where it's like really it's like relevant because because the first three him. movies are in the lead up to World War Two, but not during World War Two. Mm-hmm. And then the second one references things that he did during the war, but we don't get to see those. Mm-hmm. Whereas this would be kind of interesting where it's like, you know, you look at like, you know, all these events, especially wars in history, mm-hmm. very removed both literally because it's like thousands of years ago, but all mm-hmm. just uh, cognitively and emotionally. Whereas like a thousand years from now, someone's going to be looking at this time period. Yeah. As impartially yeah. and unemotionally as you do with like the ancient Greeks. But for you, it's, it's very weird. visceral. Yeah. And, then, and that way you could have tied it into like this 
time travel that'd be, thing, which we'll get into, yeah. where it's like now you're actually now in this period that you're always so impartially looking at. Yeah. And not to his fault. Like, that's just how human that's like how we work. That's how it is, right? Like, but, you it's know, not he's you're always like, because of these people dying 3,000 years but he, ago. You know, he's, he's always like, oh, wow, this is so cool and discovering stuff. And, you know, this is why this is there. I wanted to explore this person's, the, yeah. you know, these people stole it from these people or whatever. And this happened and this person killed this person. These were human beings but, who did, who like yeah, lived and, and but it's loved. Like, now and, he's like and, in it. And it's like, oh, yeah. like, you know, that reading a log line of you know and the trojan war thousands of people died you know is like it's a little bit like, more impactful <laughs> yeah than like your friend getting sliced by a trojan soldier or something yeah you know I mean? like, like it's very different but again the film isn't is this the first indiana jones film where he, they've inserted him into real events because the parade the, the the parade is a real parade though there was no shooting as far as I'm aware, uh, the most would maybe be I think I think I he's in think Germany so? during during like the, the burning of the books and crystal. Oh Nuts. yes, but that's like that's more of like a he's a like, moment than an event. Does that make sense? He's at crystal Nuck and he gets his book signed or what or the map signed. But you uh, feel like that's not to me the same thing because that's the more of like a moment. I guess it happened on one no, night, but I'm saying uh, that that was more like a moment. I don't as think opposed so. to like this historical event that like like. Or, or rather, I should say... They were say, always things, right? They were always, like, big, like... He like, was at Crystal Knock, you know. but he didn't do anything that would have changed the history. Yeah. Whereas this, like... This takes place in an alternate universe where there's, like, a shooting... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not that this is a problem, but this is just something I noticed. Like, is this the first one that's done that? Where yeah. he's actually now, like, taken part in, like, an actual historical event and, like... Well, I guess... In a way aliens. that changes it. <laughs> but that didn't... That, there was no historical <laughs> event in that movie. The, all of the Mayan like ruins got up and left. And just left. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. But that was also um, back to what I was saying about Helena is that like I I feel like oh this is oh please don't come at me about this but it is my Ooh, okay what are you gonna say <laughs> it is my observation. That we have not yet cracked the code in terms of uh, gender equality or gender equity in terms of media representation um, mm -hmm. because it's really just when things happen, it's just replacing a man with a woman, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and this is all this is all like um afabs right um and right because so, the, so like, the mainstream politics is so behind that we can only look at it from like a cisgendered perspective because we're not yeah. even at the point which like is, we're still trying to get just cis women yeah to but a certain the, level let alone everything yeah, else but then yeah. that's what i'm saying is kind of like with the barbie thing and this like like obviously like women are are flawed human beings and right have their own things but like i feel like the the message that's being said is just like flipping it on its head so like now now helena's the one with like who's like you know all money driven and like you know getting into trouble gambling debts has like is like engaged to a moroccan mobster question mark like you know so it's like all of the kind of things that like he was is now it's just like her mm -hmm. which like is fine if that's her person right but i feel like just in the context it just seems like like at the end of barbie when it was like okay now it's just like an all ladies world like <laughs> okay well that you know if you're if you're looking for like some type of equity like that's not it's not really like a all. positive and by positive i don't mean like it just the way we mean like good or bad, but just positive in terms of like positive meaning that it exists and negative meaning like it's more out of omission. Mm -hmm. Like it's not quite a positive it's, solution. It's, it's kind of just like we're just gonna flip it. It's like the political cartoon that like it's like oh like we're like our country is being bombed. It's like oh well I heard their president is a woman. Oh that's progressive. Really makes you feel part of history yeah, as you're getting bombed by them. Yo, yeah. Yeah. No, so I like, see what you're saying. No, a hundred percent. I thought so so this is I don't necessarily agree with 
all of the, not what you said, but what I'm about to say. Yeah. That there's a big. I, I don't know the best way to do it. So I think you're touching on something. I'm gonna. Uh, like, I'm gonna something elucidate that I, for that you. I've noticed. There, this is this is not. This is a very uh, much talked about topic. Mm -hmm. So why don't I kind of give some context and then, because I think you're touching on something that you don't know, like is already a broader conversation. So no, why don't I, I provide some context and I mean, kind of. yeah, I just don't, I don't know. But I can give you some <laughs> specific kind of like things to then we can kind yeah, of like yeah, evaluate. Yeah. So a big thing that people complain about, which is like 99% unfair, but there's like a sliver of truth, but for the wrong reason, is sexist, racist. And maybe I'm not being fair to them, but I'm just going to, I'm going to paint in broad strokes. Like rampant sexism and, and racism um, against, so, so basically let me, let me take like five steps back. What? <laughs> but this is related to this. And then that will be a good segue maybe into talking about the, like the background on this film yeah. is corporations. Um, have you ever, you, you've heard woke capital. Oh, are you talking about when when a company is failing, they hire a female CEO? No, that that's like a subset of this. But all I'm but well, capitalism in its broadest sense, in my view, is basically when corporations will cynically mm -hmm. adopt uh, worldviews or political beliefs or mm -hmm. pl make political statements cynically to help the bottom line. Yeah. Um, oh, I hate so, that. So yeah. so so like. The big one is like it's after so George Floyd's murder, like every like like it's it's important, but like Macy's, what do you know about right? Like what are you actually gonna do? Like they'll be like, We stand against racism and it's like, well, what are you gonna do about it? I mean like A, I don't think you can, and even if you could, you wouldn't do it. Because that yeah. also means like raising the minimum wage. It means yeah. doing like right, so so the way this extends to media and and Hollywood is in the bit this is like the third episode. Oh my god! Haven't... I it's on airplane mode and that was a, airplane and, mode doesn't that, and, that was a, that was an alert and do not disturb. I forgot about the alarm. You forgot about the. You I'm what? sorry. Yeah. You know what? You're gonna be sorry. You know what? What? In in three to four weeks, you won't hear any alarms That's at all. That's right. Because Viviana's finishing her master's program. Guess what it was? Program. It was an alarm to do my homework. And homework what, what am I doing? Recording a podcast. Yes. I would argue because I did I did my homework earlier just to know. <laughs> yeah, she she not just claims she finished it and is working on next week's homework. I'm not just flagrantly mm. ignoring it. Anyway. But um, what I was gonna say, so the way this extends to Hollywood, mm -hmm. and I would say, like you could make the argument that they've been doing this since like the '90s with like kind of like the black, like golden age, not golden age, but like you see in like the late '80s and '90s, like a huge up up. Uh, what's the word like? Res like I don't want to say resurgence because it hadn't happened before, but like surge. a huge surge. Thank you, a huge surge of like black stories mm -hmm. and filmmakers, right? So like Spike Lee's probably like the epitome of this era, right? Mm -hmm. So you could probably date this back like thirty years now, but really, probably in the, about the past decade. Mm -hmm. And it's no coincidence that this is this follows. Um, the like really the advent and dawn of social media. I promise this is going to tie into this. This is okay. like very broad. Um, <laughs> it's no accident that this period, you know, succeeds uh, the advent of social media and more diverse voices being able to like have a platform, as mm -hmm. well as like the election of a black president in the United States, mm -hmm. right? So this is this is not a coincidence, right? Hollywood is basically like. It, it's also a big thing. I think it's like 2014, the big Oscar so white hashtag campaign. Oh, yeah. Right? Which, on the surface, basically just like, you know, there are no black nominees in like these major categories, right? But the larger kind of point was, it's not just the Oscars' fault. It's the industry for not yeah. giving those people a platform to then get Oscar. Like, it's not just the Academy's fault, yeah, yeah. right? Um, so you see a concerted effort in the Oscar, in the Academy, but also in Hollywood to try to, um, you know, to, to do better. Mm -hmm. But what's the solution? So this is also the same era of like the reboot, mm -hmm. which again had really started in the 2000s, but like was really ramping up like the, especially with the Force Awakens. So what do they do? They start taking legacy properties. Yeah, like with the Ghostbusters. And, but it's like yeah. they gender flip it yeah. or they race flip it, which I am not against. This, no. I am not, I am not, um, I'm not arguing against this. My problem is how cynical it is. Mm -hmm. 
That they're doing it really just like, they're not changing anything. They're just throwing women or people of color mm -hmm. into roles, knowing that they're going to get harassed and, and they don't do anything about it. So you have like people like like what John Boyega and Daisy Ridley were like got horrible uh, reactions on 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 the internet, especially John Boyega. Like a black stormtrooper. This is this is ridiculous. Star Wars has gone woke. Blah 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 blah. Oh. Um. So it's the issue is, but they have that. But then all of their marketing was like. So the lead up to The Force Awakens, the marketing made it seem like Finn was going to be like the main character. He's going to be a Jedi. Yeah. He doesn't end up being, like, it's kind of a bait and switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, no, no, it's still going to be a white, it's just a white lady now. Yeah. Right? So it's it just feels very cynical. Which, like, right? it, you know, like, which is great and fine and, like, yes, that's what we want. But also it's like, it just feels like a box. You it know. feels very lazy because it's like, oh, the only way we can make it's... a black superhero popular is if we like, sw if we make a, a pre-existing white character, we make them black, mm. right? Or we make them a woman. Yeah. And that I'm not against that because it's like, how dare you change this character's gender or race? Mm -hmm. My issue is, is like, you you can't you can't you you it's not worth you trying to develop a new thing for yeah. them. To really have ownership of, yeah, you have to piggyback it off of an already pre-existing white man or whatever it is. Yeah, I um, mean, so that's more my you issue. You can tell, like, like I, I'm glad. That's why Black Panther is such a big deal because he's a black character. Yeah, like, you know, the the main character. Yeah, um, which like, I was fine. Like, I like Helena, but just like that. That's why, you know, like, so they mm -hmm. did, so they wouldn't get in trouble or whatever. They wouldn't get flack or what, you yeah. know, because they're like basically kind of, well, I guess they didn't really, but like kind of the same thing with Mutt, like kind of passing on well, the legacy. Well, I'm right? glad you bring this up. So, but, you mm -hmm. know, so it's not, it's not his godson, it's his goddaughter, you know, yeah. um, which like I said, is fine and right. And I love uh, Marion. She's a badass, whatever. But like, you know, it it's like. It feels very disingenuous. That's all. Like, mm -hmm. it's like I can, I can tell. And I don't, I don't know if it's disingenuous on James Mangold, the director's part. I don't think he's. I think he's sincere in creating this character. No, I think yeah. Phoebe Waller Bridge is sincere in playing this character. Yeah, but yeah. I think the larger kind of corporate angle feels. And and it, and I think I talked about this in my research, which we which we can get to shortly. Is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this was if this has been proven or confirmed, but I believe the film went through extensive reshoots very last minute for the ending. Oh. I think they were gonna kind of pass the mantle on to her. Mm hmm Like very explicitly so. Yeah, yeah. And um I think they did test screenings mm. and people hated it. Really? Um, again, yeah. I think, and again, I don't know how much of in good faith those reactions were, but especially yeah. people online who were hearing about it were like, serves Disney right, they're Jamaican Indiana Jones woke, and blah, 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 blah. So I don't know. I, okay. I th I, so I wouldn't be surprised if he had stayed in the past, in the I original version, because that felt to. very weird, because they were doing all this stuff to make yeah. it seem like, and it would kind of, and I wrote this in my notes, like, this kind of feels like the perfect ending to Indiana Jones. Like, he spent so much of his life researching history. He gets to be but, a part of it. And yeah. then at the last second, it's kind of like, oh, never mind. And they kind of just go like, oh, like you need to be here, Indy. Why? Yeah. Well, I thought it was going to be, like, cool that he was going to stay a change. there. But then I was like, oh, shit, she's right. Like, he would kind of, like, change the course of history. But you could get away with it in a movie. <laughs> because, again, it's all made up anyway. So you could just say, like, oh, it you know, doesn't matter or whatever. I, I, I would not be surprised if that was part of the change, that he would stay. And he'd mm -hmm. be like, it's up to you now to, like, you know, tell my story. And he gives her the hat or yeah. something. I wouldn't be surprised if the ending was something well, like the, that. Well, the iconography is really uh, was really kind of pushed to the side, right? Like, you know, the the hat and the whip and everything seemed like an afterthought all the time. Um, it wasn't like at the forefront like it usually is. Mm -hmm. um, but probably because it's just a hat. No, I know, but it's usually like, yeah. oh no, Indy forgot his hat, and he's like, oh yeah, okay, sorry. Who gives a like, shit? <laughs> you know. Um, 
but I think I just had trouble because like I wanted to like really like her but then she seemed like kind of sh like a shady character so yeah. I was like wait are kind of like an, I don't want to say anti-hero but you like something yeah like like very self-interested but that's kind of her arc is that she becomes more yeah archaeologically motivated yeah it seems I guess so in that in that she like you could make me this is a stretch but you could make the argument like her if if the reason she refused to let Indy stay in the past is because he would fuck up history mm -hmm. then okay then you could make the argument that she has learned the value of history as opposed to just plundering it <laughs> I, I don't know that that's a stretch but I think she always valued it no it seemed like she was literally in it like for the money like I'm gonna I, it's it, it's it's valuable to well, know all this shit because then you can get stuff and then make a shit ton of money. Oh it, well, yes, yes, that too. Um, let me do some basic. Info. <laughs> Her and Teddy. <laughs> we've we've been going and how how can we have gone to the complex info? We haven't even done the basic info. <laughs> so this was directed by James Mangold, um, who we know on this podcast, who direct because he directed Logan. Yes. Um, he also directed films like Girl Interrupted, Walk the Line. Um, I, that's like the Johnny Cash yeah. biopic, right? Three Ten to Yuma, which I think is like a remake of like a western from like the mid century, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wolverine, which we mm -hmm. talked about, Logan, and then Ford v Ferrari. Mm -hmm. So a pretty decent uh, uh, background. Good stuff, um, James. For you know, especially for a lot of people. Um, it was written by Jez but Butterworth. Um, Je he was co-writers on Edge of Tomorrow, Inspector, and Ford v Ferrari. Um, John Henry Butterworth, so presumably brothers, uh, was also a co-writer on Edge of Tomorrow, Get On Up, and also Ford v Ferrari. Um, oh, and then David Kep. Um, oh, we've seen him. And David Kep um, was one of the co-writers for the last Indiana Jones movie, the fourth one. Uh, he yes. was also a co-writer for Spielberg's War of the Worlds um, and Jurassic <laughs> Park. Co-writer for Mission Impossible. And he also wrote Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. um, and then also James Mangold. So it's always a good sign when there's more than two writers. <laughs> it's always a great sign. Um, it was produced by Kathleen Kennedy, who is like the president of uh, Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. um, and many people blame her for like being what? Satan incarnate because oh, what? Cause she is the head of Star Wars. And under her tenure, it became all quote unquote woke. And it's just, it's just nonsense. Great. It's space. She's not a good executive, but that's not There's because of the wolf. There's aliens. Why? There can't be black people. There's aliens. There are literally fish people walking around. People with purple skin. I know. I know. Why can't but it's, they it's be okay a black to criticize person? Kathleen Kennedy, but they don't criticize her for being like a spineless executive who can't commit to <laughs> like a vision okay. for the franchise. They blame her as like, oh, they made she she made it woke. Anyway, so but she produced a bunch of so of it's Spielberg. a lady. Get she over produced it. a bunch of Spielberg stuff, including E. T. The Color Purple, Jurassic Park, War of the Worlds, and Lincoln. Oh, she um, been she's been with him for a while. And also, like, she was the lead producer on those, or like one of the main ones. But she's been working on these, I think, since Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. Um, she also produced Bridges of Madison County, The oh. Sixth Sense, Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Like I said, she is the president of Lucasfilm, and by de facto by default to the producer of the new Star Wars movies. It was also produced by Frank Marshall, who is her husband, oh. who also produced Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Sixth Sense, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and Jurassic World, and also Simon Emanuel, who I don't know who that is. Nice. Um, it was distributed by Walt Disney Go Studios Simon. Motion Go Pictures. Um, it was released in June of 2023. Like we said, it had a budget of two, $298 million and only grossed $382 million. Mm. So it was kind of a... This this film is just one of several flops that Disney has had in 2023. Because if you look at mm -hmm. this year, well, we're recording 2024, so the Ant-Man movie, the Marvels, their anime movie Wish, Elemental ended up doing okay but didn't have a strong opening, Indiana Jones. Um, Did they do a dual release on Indiana Jones or was it just in the theater? Just in the theater. Just in the, well, that's why. Yeah, but, but this is also the same year that Oppenheimer makes over a billion dollars. Oh, and it's just like a biopic. Oh, that's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so no, no, there's no excuse. You can't say, oh, well, the whole market was bad. Like, no, like, uh. people people did... This is probably one of the best post-pandemic... It's, it's the best post-pandemic year yeah, for the yeah, box yeah. office. Um, so, um, let's do a little bit of background. Of course, this always comes from Wikipedia. Um, I'm not doing enough research. Like, I'm not going that hard. 
<laughs> for you, for all seven of you listening. I'm really just copying and pasting from Wikipedia. Okay. So in terms of the development of this movie, in 1979, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg made a deal with Paramount Pictures for five Indiana Jones films. So even from the start, there was already like I remember that. an idea yeah. for, for five at some point. Um, in April 2008, Harrison Ford said he would return his Indiana Jones for a fifth film if it does not take another 20 years to develop. <laughs> um, it only took about 15 years. Um, referring to the long development of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which was released a month later. Lucas said that Ford's age would not be an issue in making another film, saying, quote, It's not like he's an old man. He's incredibly agile. He looks even better than he did 20 years ago. He does. He, they look... well, back in 2008, yeah, he didn't. He... I thought he was ancient. Back in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull when I saw it as a kid. Yeah. He's like 80-something in the story. He's old as shit, but he's he's still working. He's still working. Lucas began researching potential plot devices for another film in 2008. This is back when Lucas was still, like, owned Lucasfilm. Mm -hmm. um, and stated that Spielberg was open to directing it as he had done for the previous films. Explain the process for each film. Ford said, quote, We come to some basic agreement, and then George goes away for a long time and works on it. Then Stephen and I get in some form, some embryonic form. Then if we like it, we start working with George on it. And at some point down the line, it's ready and we do it. Um, nice. Lucas stressed the importance of having a MacGuffin that is supernatural, but still grounded in reality with an archaeological or historical background. Saying, quote, you can't just make something up like a time machine. Interesting. <laughs> Speaking about the previous okay, film, well. speaking about the previous film of the franchise's future, Lucas said, quote, we still have the issues about the direction we'd like to take. I'm in the future. Steven's in the past. He's trying to drag it back to the way they were. I'm trying to push it into a whole different place. So still we have a sort of tension. Um, and then it speaks to George Lucas again. You gotta give him credit. He doesn't like to settle and just look the same thing. Mm. Like the prequels of the Star Wars prequels, whether you like them or not, are very ambitious. Mm -hmm. and and bold in how unlike the original ones were mm. right um and i don't know if those films would have been maligned just because they're different mm -hmm. um i think the issue is just that they not they're not very good but what were you gonna say you don't even know what i'm talking about how are they different <laughs> tone <laughs> ambition because the originals were very like adventure and whereas whereas the the prequels are very like character driven. Like. No, they're like very dry political dramas, yeah. which is fine. Like I like those, but it's just not very. It's not a particularly good political drama. Mm. Whereas the originals are a lot more in the vein of like wow. a Flash Gordon, rock, like swashbuckling on the ground type of yeah. Just adventures. They're just like going on and doing stuff, so. right? It's um, Star Warsy. In July, well, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. It just seems the same because it's Star Warsy. Um, well, especially for audiences in 1999 who did not grow up with the prequels. Mm -hmm. They felt very different. For us, we're, 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 it's easier for us to kind of blend them all together despite their differences because, yeah. like, I grew up with them. Yeah. Um, well, and I feel like I, I naturally accept or, like, don't see as much of a difference because, like, I know they're two different generations. So it's like, well, like, obviously it's going to be, it might be a little different, you know, because they're different characters. And then just stylistically. But, but they like, don't feel like they're part of the same universe sometimes. Oh. In terms of, like, the tone or the, or, like, the... Well, the it's way. not. It's, like, 20 years in difference. The story, the film, the, the artistic side, there should <laughs> still be a consistency. I guess so. Anyway. Um, in July of 2012, producer Frank Marshall stated that the project had no writer and said about its progress, quote, I don't know if it's definitely not happening, but it's not up and running. <laughs> so this is about like a decade ago. In October 2012, the Walt Disney Company acquired Lucasfilm, giving Disney ownership rights to the Indiana Jones intellectual property. Um, in December of 2013, the Walt Disney Studios purchased the distribution and marketing rights to future Indiana Jones films from Paramount. So, yeah, because Lucasfilm owned the material, but Paramount owned the distribution rights to the mm. film. Um, so they bought those rights from Paramount with the latter studio retaining the, the distribution rights to the first four films and receiving financial participation for any additional films as well as a quote in association with end quote credit in the film's billing. So that's, at the beginning you see the Walt Disney logo and then the Paramount logo. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is the first one that doesn't have the Paramount logo like fade into something else. Mm -hmm. The way like in the first one it's like that mountain in the jungle and the fourth one it's like the little groundhog hole Mm, yes. bound um the fifth the fifth film would become the first in the series to be co-produced by walt disney pictures and lucasfilm 
In May of 2015, Kennedy confirmed that Lucasfilm would eventually make another Indiana Jones film. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull ended po ended positively for Indiana Jones, right, with his marriage to Mary. Yes. Um, however, Ford did not necessarily view the film as a definitive en ending for Jones, wishing to make one more film that could expand the character and conclude his journey. Um, in terms of pre-production, in March of 2016, Disney announced that the fifth film would be released on July 19th, 2019, uh, with Ford reprising his role. Yeah, see how that <laughs> Spielberg would direct the film with Kennedy and Marshall as producers. It was initially reported that Lucas would not be involved in the project, although Spielberg later said that Lucas would serve as an executive producer. Quote, of course I would never make an Indiana Jones film without George Lucas. That would be insane. End quote. <laughs> Later in 2016, it was announced that Lucas would have no involvement with uh, have no involvement with Marshall stating two years later that quote life changes and we're moving on. He moved on. End quote. <laughs> it's very sad. Um, in 2017, as he said about Star Wars, George Lucas, he's like, I sold it off to the white slavers. <laughs> the most ridiculous comment ever. Uh, in 2017, the film's release date was pushed back to 2020, a great year for releasing movies. As Spielberg was busy working on The Post and Ready Player One, Spielberg set Indiana Jones 5 as his next film, with production set to begin in the UK in April 2019. However, filming was pushed back as a final script had yet to be approved. Jonathan Kasdan was eventually hired to replace Kep, in, um, who was one of the writers, in mid-2018, and a new release date was set for 2021. Jonathan Kasdan is the son of Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote the first Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. Um, he also wrote so, um, Empire nepotism. Strikes Back. Well, okay. okay. Yes, basically. <laughs> um, Kasdan had departed the project by May 2019, so no one wants to do this movie. What? Um, it's like the clip we watched for the fourth one when Steven Spielberg is like, I don't want to make this movie. <laughs> and she's like, then George talked me into it. So I said, oh, fine. <laughs> it's the same thing's going on here. So Kasdan departed the project uh, by May of 2019. In September of 2019, Kep announced that he had rejoined the production as writer, oh saying gosh. that the filmmakers had, quote, a good idea this time, end quote. <laughs> Uh, Kep ultimately wrote two versions of the film, but neither were approved. He said that efforts to produce the film had failed, Excuse me, because of the disagreement between Spielberg, Ford, and Disney regarding the script. In February 2020, a, a not consequential moment in history, <laughs> Spielberg stepped down as director as he wanted to pass the film series to a new filmmaker for a fresh perspective. Kennedy later said that Spielberg, quote, was kind of was kind of off and on, end quote, about directing the project. So he's really hemming and hawing and was noncommittal about it. Mm -hmm. James Mangold was confirmed as director in May of 2020 when he began work on a new script. Um, kept a part of the project again after Spielberg stepped down, saying it, quote, seemed like the right time to let Jim, ha James Mangold, have his own take on it and have his own person or himself write it, end quote. Mangold, there's a lot of info here. Mangold had <laughs> considered turning down the director position as Lucasfilm wanted filming to begin in about six months to meet the 2021 release date. Oh. However, Mangold wanted more time so he could refine the script. He eventually signed on to the project after the COVID-19 pandemic pushed back the release date, giving him the time he wanted. Very conveniently. Yes. Um, Mangold wrote the new screenplay with Jez and John Henry Butterworth, who worked with him previously on Ford v. Ferrari over the course of six to eight months. Mangold said, quote, I wanted to really retool the existing script pretty aggressively, almost entirely, end quote. Mangold conceived the film's time travel element and its use of the anti-Kathira, is that how you would say anti-Kathira? Yeah. Anti-Kathira mechanism as the MacGuffin. To suit the story, artistic liberty was taken with the film's dial, giving it the ability to detect time fissures. Because it is a real thing. The, the object is a real um, archaeological item that we have. Oh, really? Um, yes, but it has no magical time powers. Hmm. It had to do, I think, with, like, predicting the, the star alignments or something. Mm -hmm. I forget. Um, Mangold considered time travel on par with the previous film. Quote, previous films. Quote, it's no more of a wild swing in my mind than ghouls flying out of a box and melting people's heads through the sheer power of dark angels or a 700-year-old knight existing in a cave for perpetuity. These are all beyond the scope of all physical belief. End quote. I completely agree. So, and that's why I get annoyed. We talked about this before with people like, the fourth one's so stupid. I is it that much more ridiculous than the other one? And again, I'm a God-fearing believer, all right, of Jesus Christ. There's no way... That there's a, a, a dude, a 700-year-old crusader. How did he eat? What did he eat? That, that's preposterous. How is he alive? The, of all of the storylines, the one about interdimensional beings is the most plausible. <laughs> but anyway. I don't know. Just something about it seems off. That's why. 
I don't know. It's like it's like it seems like it doesn't fit for some reason. Because it's it's like aliens, and we think of Indiana Jones as more like fantasy, and not like science fiction. But like I guess anyway, so. earlier films had featured Nazis as the antagonists, and Mangold and Butterworth and the Butterworths were inspired by Operation Paperclip as a way of reincorporating them for Dial of Destiny, which I. Talked, told you about yesterday and you laughed at the name. I don't know why it was called that. But essentially, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Operation Paperclip was a secret government program to basically bring Nazis over after World War II, bring them to the United States uh, to help them work on our space program. Um, since the Nazis had been like real pioneers in rocket technology. Um, Horrible people. Great minds. Yeah. And the Soviets did the exact same thing. That We basically both rounded up as many Nazi scientists as we each could mm -hmm. and brought them over, changed their names. They lived kind of in secret. Oh, wow. Um, and this is all true. This isn't like a conspiracy no, theory yeah. or something. I mean, they're, they're smart people. They're just, well, yeah, that's the thing, yeah. Just also horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mangold consulted with Lucas and Spielberg, who served as executive producers. At the script, As the script was being written, Mangold would send pages to the duo for input. Recalling advice that Spielberg offered... Mangold said, quote, it's a movie that's a trailer from beginning to end. Always be moving, end quote. <laughs> and also, this movie did, I think, have kind of like a pacing problem where it kind of felt like it was always just like... Did it? There was like eight chase scenes, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. Um, in terms of casting, yeah. despite Ford's age, Marshall and Spielberg ruled out the possibility of recasting his character. Ford said, quote, I'm Indiana Jones. When I'm gone, he's gone, end quote. Ford was paid ten to twelve million dollars for his involvement. I think I read somewhere it was maybe as high as even twenty million, what? which were approaching like Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow levels. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the Crystal Skull episode, but I'll reiterate here. So, following the release of Crystal Skull, Shia LaBeouf criticized the film and Spielberg, although Mangold said this did not factor into Mutt's absence in Dial of Destiny. Um, well, hold on, LaBeouf criticized the film and Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Although Mangold said this did not factor in Mutt's absence in Dial of Destiny. Saying, quote, mm -hmm. there's only so many people you can edge into a picture. End quote. I don't like the verb edge because that means something else. Mm -hmm. He further said about Mutt, quote, I didn't think his whole thing worked that well in the previous film. End quote. As in the earlier films, Mangold wanted to instead capture, quote, that wonderful energy between Indy and an intrepid female character. Only this time he's not trying to sleep with her, as far <laughs> as we know. I added that last part. Mangold kept his options open about Mutt still being alive and simply off screen, although he said, quote, the reality is you want the story to focus on the characters that are in the picture. And so and so saying someone's out wandering off in the periphery seems sadder, seems a sadder purgatory than actually making them a story point of the film and using their character's existence as a tremendous source of drama for some of our lead characters, end quote. Mutt was also absent in Kep's original draft. Oh, I just thought it because he went off the deep end. What did he do? He was just like yelling at people. Something. I forgot. What are you talking about? So Shia Buff has had many problems, but the thing they're talking about is that after the film came out, I know, had horrible I, reception. I know, and he 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 spoke out. He, he was kind of bad mouthing the movie. He spoke out against and... the family. He spoke out against the family in terms of Spielberg in the movie, but I mean like the other stuff. It didn't help that he's gone off the deep end anyway. No, I know. I'm saying what what was that? He was just. I know the video where he's like flexing and shouting wasn't well he? he's just he's just i think he's i believe he's been accused yeah, of of abuse substance of, of of not being the best partner to fka twigs oh yes fka twigs but shia labeouf has gone through like a massive like catholic conversion really yes he played padre pio in a movie recently hmm. padre pio was like a very controversial priest who like mm -hmm. claimed to um have the stigmata mm. which is something that Catholics believe like will appear. It's like where Jesus was nailed into the cross, yeah, and yeah. and he recently, like I'm like a couple weeks ago, yeah, like became Catholic. Like he had his confirmation, and he's like, I might become a deacon. What? Like he's he's gone through this whole thing. So you know, I, I as a as a Catholic, so, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, but also he's so just a very he, troubled. He's guy, figuring so himself know. out. Um, but anyway, he he had a very tough upbringing. His is like in terms of being a child star, and his father mm. kind of really pushing him. Like to do more. He, Remember, watch that movie was that he, he in directed. Stuff before Holes. Even Stevens. And oh, stuff. even oh yes, even Stevens. Oh my gosh, how did I forget even Stevens? Yes. In terms of the effects of the film, mm -hmm. and I don't mean the effect it had on society, but the visual effects. <laughs> 
Uh, by mid-2019, Spielberg and Kep had devised a five-minute World War II opening sequence that would feature a de-aged Ford. Upon taking over the project, Mangold expanded the sequence to roughly 25 minutes. So it's like this extended prologue almost. Mm. Um, more than 100 ILM artists worked on the opening sequence over a three-year period using various oh. methods. Ford was de-aged to depict his appearance during the first three Indiana Jones films. This was partly achieved using new artificial intelligence software from ILM, which looked through archived footage of a younger Ford in his previous work for Lucasfilm, including the original Star Wars films. Mm -hmm. um, after filming, the de-aging footage was modified shot by shot using a variety of techniques, which would have, which sounds painstakingly difficult and time-consuming. Yeah, um, I mean, years. And it looks okay, but it does not look great. Um, as to a lot of the VFX of this film, like it a lot of it looks very green screeny. Mm. And like, like a video game. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the release, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny had its world premiere at the seventy sixth Con Film Festival, screening out of competition. So it just means it was just it was it, just there, yeah. yeah. On, on May 18, twenty twenty three, exactly fifteen years after the Con premiere of the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, um, I don't know why they thought this would be a good because sometimes they'll do this with films. I believe Logan. It's, its premiere was at the Venice Film Festival or the mm. Telluride Film or some, one of those. And it's like a good kind of PR thing mm -hmm. to build, build the momentum of the film leading into it. I don't know what they were thinking mm. um, because it kind of backfired. So the film received a lukewarm five-minute standing ovation. So the thing about standing ovations at Cannes, yeah. like every film gets a standing ovation. Uh. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. They just do. Um, so the fact that it only ha it was only five minutes is like lukewarm, mm. and it received That's a pretty a long time to be clapping. I know, right? Sometimes you hear like these fifteen minutes standing ovations. What? Like, so. Um, oh. so it received it, it received a shorter standing ovation and received a divisive reaction from attending critics. I remember when it because like reviews came out because typically reviews for films don't come out to like maybe the week of. Sometimes earlier, mm -hmm. it, it usually depends on how confident the studio is. So if there are no... Because what will happen is reviewers will see a movie, but there's an embargo. Mm -hmm. So, like, basically, they're not allowed to post the review until, like, a certain date. Yeah. Um. So sometimes critics may have seen the film a month before the movie comes out, but, they don't, but they're not allowed to post it until, right? If the embargo date is, like, the day before, mm -hmm. they're usually not... Con the studio, it means the studio isn't really confident in Oh. Whereas, like, if they're really confident, they'll be like, "Yeah, post it three weeks or before." Mm -hmm. They want to go. The fact they did this because that was what May. This was like six weeks before the movie came out. Oh, wow. I remember seeing the bad reviews. Yeah, and I was like, "They killed!" And no wonder it didn't make a lot of money because it had six weeks of of just negative critical reception. Yeah, and at least when you when that happens with a regular film, okay, but it's like a week, but then. Regular people see it and they form the... This was just mm -hmm. six week, a monopoly of just negative reception. Mm -hmm. So uh, no wonder then in terms of the box office, due to its expensive production cost and marketing budget, the film was deemed a box office bomb. Yikes. Not just a flop, a bomb. In August 2023, Variety reported the film was on pace to lose Disney $100 million, making it one of Disney's largest financial film failures since John Carter, which is another one of their huge financial failures in 2012. Well, um... So we've talked. I think, I think they, I think they had and Let's do a post-mortem here. Why, why did it not do well financially or critically? Well, I think they they had an ambitious goal, and which was what, which was pulling on legacy fans, right, and then also bringing in a new audience, and kind of merging those two together uh, to get them both to the box office, and that is ultimately difficult to do, um, mm -hmm. and. I think may, they might have, you know, tried their be <laughs> tried their best, but ultimately it didn't work uh, for whatever reason. And yeah, I don't know. For, for me, like, I don't know what it is. I I don't like. <laughs> I don't always like new movies. If that makes sense, like, they just look too like too perfect. Like, watching the like. 
first five minutes or something, it it felt so strange. I was like, oh, I'm not going to like this movie. Because I was like, like, where's, like, the grit of, you know, like... Mm-hmm. Well, this is this is the first stuff. one. This is the first film in the franchise to be shot on digital cameras, too. Yeah. So I think I think the word isn't like it looks the perfect. The issue is that it's like it, it has like a stale kind of digital sharpness as opposed to like film, which has like really good color quality and like yeah. the texture and like. And I I also felt kind of weird about the last one too, um, because I think it also gives off that vibe like. I don't know. That might uh, also just be perception and just like we we assign certain values to a certain look just because it's like an older look. No, I mean like it's fine. Like I, I I'm fine with. I'm watching sure people in 1981 like watching the first one are like, oh, this one looks too modern. No, I know. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like, like there was that grit from the 60s where it's like all <laughs> grainy. You know, so I think it's, it's like just that. I mean, like I don't know, like uh, the set design and, and and especially the cinematography. I don't know. It doesn't I, feel tactile. Yeah. Whereas even the last one, which also used a lot of CGI and green screen, like yeah, didn't use it as much. Like this, this feels like a lot of it was filmed on green screen. Yeah. Like, I didn't um, always feel like the characters were, were... It didn't always seem like they were where they were. Yeah. Like, they seemed like they were kind of composited into locations. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so that kind of, like, was a little disappointing. But as it as it kept going, like, I got more into it. Um, and I actually wasn't... I wasn't too disappointed. Um, I thought it was cute. Um, that was cute. I think sometimes the tone is a little weird. A two hundred million uh, dollar, two hundred fifty million dollar movie. That's cute. <laughs> like, but I think I don't think you're wrong. You know, I think it's just fun. like it's like. Well, it, it like it was like cute, but it's not like necessarily like satisfying. You know, for like mm-hmm. this character. Like I don't know. Yeah, because there's a lot of ways to look at this. It is the. Final, presumably final film for this character. Oh my god! If they make it, he's gonna be like a hundred years old. They will absolutely not. <laughs> the the well, here's the thing: is if that, he's still moving, he would do it. But here's the thing: so <laughs> this is really interesting, and it's kind of in a similar situation, to Star Wars, mm-hmm. where it was like you have this beloved trilogy of films, yeah, and then a decade, decade, two decades later, they revisit it. Mm-hmm. With more modern technology, yeah, and it's not received well. Mm-hmm. And then maybe a decade or so after that, they try it again. Yeah. But I don't know why it worked. I mean, ultimately, I think people's evaluation of the sequel Star Wars films is like pretty meh. Mm-hmm. But when that when Force Awakens came out, that was a cultural phenomenon mm-hmm. because not only was it the return of Star Wars, but it was the second return of Star Wars after the first one went in a lot of people's minds so poorly. Mm-hmm. And that was that was a huge cultural moment. Yeah, probably you know up there with like Endgame. I would say even bigger than Endgame. Just just the hype for Star Wars for yeah. the Force Awakens. It's huge. Yeah. Um, this did not enjoy that success. No, because <laughs> Force Awakens like, it was like a huge financial juggernaut for for yeah. Disney and Lucasfilm. This is like one of their biggest failures. Not just in the past twenty five years, but like ever. So yeah. and and it's not it's not just like the cinematography and I don't really have like all the words to say it but like okay go on Letterbox and look at the look at the poster this looks this poster looks like the rest of the films posters right if for those of you who but can't, this who aren't does looking, not it's like, it's look like more illustrated like that anything old style. like like the movie at all. And I know this is a like watercolor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like it just the, gives off a tone, you know, or like an aesthetic yeah. that the film, the film feels very flat aesthetically. Yeah, and like I I remember going. Whereas that to, has a personality. That I remember like going to the movies and there was the like big um oh what are those called like the big cutout right um and it was like of Harrison and you know he's like leaning back or whatever he's got his you know like little outfit on and i was like so excited you know but now seeing it i'm like this does not compute like this doesn't go with i I think that's another reason why he wasn't uh, in his costume for a long time was because it would look out of place but like almost like sad 
Yeah, but it's like, I feel like, like, I don't know if it's like... It's because you're not Indiana Jones anymore. I don't know. Unfortunately. You're just, you're just, like, what Indiana Jones is, Mm -hmm. in a lot of people's minds, is like that 1981 Mm -hmm. version of him. Um, Which, like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I was fine with the new, older one. I thought it... Could yeah. be good, you know. I know. I mean, Harrison's still kicking. It's not like you know. No, he, I know. He's and geriatric. So. I think. I think we maybe talked about this when we talked about when we covered this franchise. That in Star Wars did this a lot, and every <laughs> other like legacy sequel that's come out like the past ten years, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like we're bringing it back the old team. It, yeah. It's like, why are you so creatively bankrupt that uh-huh. all you can imagine an elderly Indiana Jones is just doing the same thing he has always been doing, but older? Yeah. Right? I don't so know. that you see that too in the, in with Han Solo in the in the newer Star Wars films. Where it's yeah. like it's like he's still just doing the same thing <laughs> as like a 70-year-old man. Yeah. Even in the Star Wars universe. And in uh, both of them, he's divorced. What are are his characters not good in a relationship? Why can't he like why why couldn't it be like um uh, it it would have been I don't know. An idea that's come to me just now is maybe like he's like a grandpa and he, you know him and Marion live together and then like maybe their grandkids or something come by and then like they're looking through the attic, right? And they find this stuff and then they're like, oh, what is this? And then, you know, like it inspires them or something. I, I don't know. That kind of, sounds kind of cheesy, but I, I'm just saying like, they're, they're- It's maybe not the best idea, but it's pointing towards a better <laughs> version. There should, yeah. Like, why did he move to New York to work at Hunter? He wanted to like, make, well, honey, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Uh, like, he, wanted to, he wanted to take a bite of the Big Apple. Like, that's so random. Like, he's never been, like, involved in society. Like, like he's like, you know, he's always, like, I don't know. Almost, like, outside it. Yeah, he's, uh, I mean, like. That's what I was trying to say before, where it's, like, it, it's not really wrestling with him <laughs> being in a world that's passed him by. Mm-hmm. Because they don't really do that in this movie. But at least this movie does it more than the other ones. Like, we never really feel like... Like, in the other ones, it takes place in the 30s. Mm-hmm. But we never really get a sense of, like, the cultural, like, milieu of the 30s, you know? Yeah. Like... like Which, like... You know? Because it's, like, cool to see him in this time period. Mm-hmm. And have him be, like... Like, they're, like his neighbors are playing the Beatles lolly. He's like, turn was, off that racket! Like, that was funny, like, there's yeah. a delight in that, even if it's, again, kind of, like... The obvious thing to do mm-hmm. but it, it again it, it reflects like uh like this is really tangential <laughs> but i've been thinking about it a lot okay is in oppenheimer mm-hmm. they they never explicitly make this connection but there's this montage when he's a student in europe mm-hmm. and he's like basically experiencing European art, especially, like, modern art, Mm -hmm. which is, like, pushing boundaries. And actually, they do kind of do it explicitly, where it's, like, there's a scene where he's, like, looking at this, like, kind of abstract painting. Mm -hmm. And it's not, like, what you expect for the Renaissance, where it's all about realism, right? It's, Mm -hmm. like... And in the the same ways that art, artists are are blowing up convention and putting the pieces back together, Oppenheimer is blowing up the traditional ideas of physics... Mm-hmm. And, he's, and he even says that it was like the world's in revolution why can't like you know he says we're, he's talking to his colleague and he's like you know we're, we're, we're partaking in a revolution in physics can't you see the revolution elsewhere as well mm-hmm. right so there's like this idea that it's like a post a modern world mm-hmm. capital M modern like that movement that philosophical movement of modernism influences Oppenheimer in a way Mm-hmm. To think outside the box. Yeah. About certain things. I would like to see that where it's like Indy being confronted with new ways of seeing the world. Mm-hmm. So it's like, like, ha ha ha, his neighbor, he has like a hippie neighbor who's playing the thing. But it's like, <laughs> what did the Beatles and that countercultural movement philosophically represent? And how does that, uh, if not come into conflict, at least create a tension? Mm-hmm. An interesting tension or conversation with how Indiana Jones views the world. Mm-hmm. The problem is, he's not a character. He's never been a character. 
there's nothing interesting about this character. Well, that's, this is what I've complained about this whole time. That's something too. Yeah, is that I just remember. They've never been like that. movies in the sense of like things just happen really to deep. Him. Yeah, the only one that's really explored it would be unfortunately the last one and this one of him actually being like a character. Yeah. Well, look, I guess the third one with his father, but that's very yeah, yeah. surface level in my opinion. Um, so I don't know. I just feel like again the movie on paper like that's a really interesting premise, but it's like that all is more set dressing. Yeah. So it's like, okay, he's on the train and, like, people are excited because of the moon landing. So, like, there's a kid next to him wearing, like, a space helmet. And, mm-hmm. like, you know, so it's, like, little nods to things. Would've but been. not really, like, okay, what does that mean now? And she she addresses it. A Phoebe Waller-Bridge, she's like, what do you think the ancients would have thought that we walked on the moon? Oh, yeah, yeah. I forget what he says, but he kind of, like, dismisses the question. But that's really interesting. No, I thought she... She asks the the German guy, and he was like, "Oh, oh, I thought she asked him. Nothing. I'm pretty sure she asked him because they're in the bar and she sees the TV. No, oh, 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 maybe. I forget what he says, but I just remember it, it, him being kind of dismissive of of the of the the question, mm-hmm. like the whole premise of the question. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that again that wrestles it it, it the moon landing. I think culturally. Mm-hmm was really important because again it kind of blew the barriers open of what was possible mm. it expanded the cultural imagination mm. and i think that's important for someone whose whole thing is about studying like archaeology is not literally just about like important pots <laughs> and like like it is those things reflect a culture mm-hmm. so you're in one of the most p- important cultural moments of the 20th century mm-hmm. and it feels incidental mm-hmm you know um it would yeah i think now thinking more about it i think it would be kind of cool to see you know how his character interacts i I mean the the 60s is just it's like a grocery store pick just pick anything you want you know in terms of stuff right so you know having his character interact with literally anything right vietnam like you know, why is there, you know, uh, could he be, I don't know, part of protesters or something for Vietnam? And then there is like that protest that goes by. And then it's like fueled by like Mutt's death or something. And he's like trying to use his history knowledge to like, like kind of bring logic and reason to the messaging of the anti-war or, or civil rights. I, I don't know. Just like, or even the moon land, just like, you know, just interacting a little bit more with, with what's going on because so many things happened and like, yeah, it's, it's like just a gold mine of like mm-hmm. things to, to explore um, yeah. artistically or as a, as a writer and everything, you know? Yeah. And, and also there's this thing of like, like again this is maybe this is unfair because i'm just kind of projecting what i wish this film and these films wrestled with Mm -hmm. but i i think there there should be a more political angle to a lot of this Mm -hmm. or rather there is one but it's kind of unknown so we talked about earlier as well as in other episodes on this franchise about like what is the politics of archaeology and like that's a very interesting Mm -hmm. modern thing Mm-hmm. In my mind, but that was being talked about in the eighties too. It's not like they oh, didn't think of that. And, and another thing too is is with Sala, right? And he oh, who's such a such a throwaway cameo, <laughs> literally just like, hey, remember this guy? We yeah. Clap, but clap, because like... it's Sala, this white guy <laughs> playing a Middle Eastern Egyptian man. But then also to call to like what we were talking about earlier, it's like you know. Oh, this is the man who helped us get to America. And then he's like, oh, well, my grandkids know what it means to be American and Egyptian. And it's like... What does that mean? You know? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> okay, like, you're tapping into something, but, like, you're not really, like, doing anything to show it, you know? Yeah. How do we feel... I don't know. To be fair, the second film, The mm-hmm. Temple of Doom, had nothing to do with Mm-hmm. So really, it's only the first and the third one. But how do we feel? Oh, the, Russians, yeah. the fourth one's the Russians. The Russians, yeah. 
The, the Soviets, I should say. Because she's from Ukraine, technically. Excuse me, the Soviets. Um, how do we feel about the big bad once again being the Nazis? <laughs> I, I find it very cynical. Again, comparing it to Star Wars. Mm -hmm. A big thing with the sequel trilogy was like, okay, George Lucas tried something completely different with the prequels and people hated it. Mm -hmm. So let's just do the other extreme and become like sl like slavishly tap into uh, the original. To the point where The Force Awakens is, is very similar narratively to the first Star Wars film. Mm -hmm. Like almost beat for beat narr on a narrative structure level. Right. Mm -hmm. This kind of feels like a similar impulse where it's like, well, they tried to do something different with the Cold War and like science fiction-y stuff, you know. And, you know, I think we talked about mm -hmm. um, that the Indiana Jones films represent the films that were popular in the time period that the films take place. Yes. So, like, the ones in the 30s are like kind of action adventure ones that would have been popular in the 30s, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. adventure serials. The fourth one takes place in the 50s, and it's kind of like a B-movie science fiction kind of story. Yeah. And I think we talked about, and it's like, okay, well, what's really popular in the late 60s? Mm -hmm. And I, I talked about, like, it's a little bit early. Like, it's more like the early 70s, but you could do, like, a political thriller. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't do that. It feels like it's more like we're just going back to what we think people want. Mm -hmm. And what do they associate with Indiana Jones is, like, punching Nazis. Right? <laughs> Which, I mean, I'm never going to argue. I'm never going to be like, oh. You punch too many Nazis. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, but but it just kind of feels a bit a bit rote. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. just just kind of like oh we're doing this again, and, and it's it historically makes sense as we talked about with Operation Paperclip. But again, I wish it explored the ethics of the Cold War, mm -hmm. which was at the time being painted as like this good versus evil struggle, mm -hmm. when in actuality it was too amoral global empires competing with one another mm -hmm. and doing amoral and immoral things to achieve supremacy over the other, right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about with the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, like it's in the Cold War, like I, I, like let's explore the issues in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But they don't. It's always like, oh, it's like just comments made. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can do the Nazis again. And you found a way to historically have it so you can do Nazis again. <laughs> yeah. But you don't do it in a way that's now taking advantage of, like, Nazis with a twist. They're just mm -hmm. Nazis again. Yeah. To the point where it's literally, like, we're going to go back in time and be be Nazi Nazis. <laughs> I know. That that's his whole so plan. Like, he wants crazy. to go back to 1939. Essentially, now with understanding how rockets work better. Yeah. Because that was a big thing is that if the Nazis had had even, like, again, they were pioneers of the technology. But if they had... If they had had the resources that we had to send a man to the moon back then, yeah. they could have easily, um, you know, conquered a lot more of, like, England especially. Like, they, that was mm -hmm. a lot of, like, I think there were, like, planes going over, but a lot of the attacks on Britain mm -hmm. um, were v, V-1 rockets being, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, being shot from, from the, the mainland. Oh. Um, so so oh, basically the, Matt Mickelson's characters... The planes... The plane bombing, right? In the, yes, the but I'm saying I think Ryan, the, the V1 Witcher rockets Wardrobe. are not from a plane. <laughs> oh, okay. A, v, a rocket would launch from the ground. No, I know, but what's the ones from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Oh, those are bombs, just bombers. Oh, okay, okay. Um, my point being is that, so Matt Mickelson's character's plan is to go back to 1939, essentially take over the Nazi party, like kill Hitler, and use his knowledge, scientific breakthrough knowledge, mm -hmm. to like, give the Nazis like a 30 year head start mm -hmm. and conquer the world, right? And Which I thought was so funny or not funny, but not like funny, funny, but like funny because like, you know, if you ever like had a conversation with someone and they're like, oh, like if you could go back in time, what would you do? Or like, what would you change or whatever? Mm -hmm. And then like, like everyone's always like, oh, like, you would like go back and like kill Hitler, right? Or like kill Hitler as a baby or like something. Or if you don't say that, right, then someone's like, what? Oh, you wouldn't stop the Holocaust? Like you wouldn't kill Hitler? Which, and so <laughs> which, which is, I always have found preposterous because <laughs> so someone always... else would have taken Hitler's place. Okay. That, sure. that, that, that move. Maybe baby wouldn't be good. Or would... No, but even if it was a baby, like someone baby. else would have filled that role. Oh, I guess so. Naturally, because it was Hitler. Hitler's kind of, like, not to get political. But it's like Trump. Like Trump, it, it, Trump 
did not create the movement. He There's tapped like, into like the a movement. power vacuum. He, yeah, he with, tapped yeah. into an existing resentment mm-hmm. in the culture. Hitler, would, someone else would have taken Hitler's place had Hitler not existed. But anyway, so I just thought it was funny that that his plan's also a to Nazi kill Hitler. was it was it was also his plan <laughs> to kill Hitler. But then you know, with the twist, the added twist of him taking Hitler's place. But I just thought that was funny because it's yeah. like you know, oh, what are you gonna do if you go yeah. back in time? Like, okay, kill Hitler. But also, I'm gonna take his place. <laughs> like, yeah, because he well, he has an interesting point where he's like, you didn't win, the Hitler lost. Yeah. That's his point where it's like, it's not like you guys like beat us in a fair game. Like Hitler was just so irrational that like he kind of, and, and again, it's like. Which happened, right? He got like paranoid at the end or something, right? And then he shot himself. I'm not just like paranoid. Like it wasn't, paranoid would imply it was irrational. Like he knew they were going to come for him. Like he knew the war was over. And by over, I mean like it was, there was no more chance of winning. Um, But Hitler made a lot of decisions that in retrospect were very irrational. Mm. Like military decisions and right, right mm. things like, but but anyway, what I was gonna say is, you know, again, I, I'm not gonna sit here and and defend Hitler. No. Right, but the film still feels like it's in like this kind of like World War Two. We like again, we try to tell ourselves it was like the moral war. It really was like again, kind of the Cold War, like a battle of good versus evil. Mm-hmm. It was, but the Allies weren't doing it because Hitler was evil. They were doing it because Hitler threatened their strategic interests, right? Mm. But films of that era, as well as our cultural memory about World War II, mm-hmm. is very like Hitler. Where, where if Hitler didn't declare war in the United States after Pearl Harbor, mm-hmm. we probably, st- if anything, the chances of America getting involved in the European side of World War II actually dropped after Pearl Harbor. Because now it's like we have to devote... Hit, Roosevelt was kind of like, shit. Now we have to devote... Like, I'm never going to convince the American people mm-hmm. to to go along with a war in Europe. Yeah. Because we need to focus all of our efforts in the Pacific. Yeah. Right? Um. So there was this... So so all these things about, like, you know, we fought Hitler and blah, blah, blah. Like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a myth. It's a story. Mm-hmm. Not saying it's not true... But it's a it's a re it's a it's a realignment of of historical memory. The reason why I'm bringing this up. What what do you say? <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that we like to think back about World War II in oh, like very, very fairy tale very storybook yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. terms. And again, not to defend Hitler, but like the the Nazis were horrible and evil. Probably the most evil group to ever exist ever. Of course. Like, you can make arguments that some ancient civilizations were worse, but the Nazis had the technology. Like, yes, the Romans... If the Romans had had the Nazi technology, the Romans would have also been awful, but they didn't. Yeah. You know, so ultimately, the Nazi... We can only judge people what they've done, right? The Nazis are probably the most evil group to have ever existed, ever. Mm. Right? But that being said, we like to reframe the conflict. Like, Hitler wanted to take over every part of the globe. Like, yeah, maybe, like, for Germany, like, 100 years from then. But Hitler's main objectives was to take over Central and Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. get rid of the Jews, turn the Slavic peoples and the Russians into, into basically a, a subservient slave working class. Mm. Um, he saw the English and the French as racial brothers. If they had never waged war on him, he wouldn't have necessarily oh, really? caused issues. Yeah. Because hmm. the, 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 the English are whiter than the Germans. <laughs> I know. I don't know. You know, so, so there was the beef was, again, because the strategic interests... Yeah. Conflicted, right? Yeah. But the reason why I'm bringing all this up... Very rude, ...is Hitler. that Indiana Jones is, especially the earlier one, the first three, are very simplistic, as we talked about. They don't really try to wrestle. And mm-hmm. in wrestling with complex topics, the result is not, oh, the Nazis weren't actually so bad. Which I feel like My is point, on purpose. I mean, that's because there's meant to be more like a throwback to like an older style of Hollywood. Where no, I, well, I mean, simpler. just in general, not to diversify, or not to... Di- di- <laughs> to make the character divisive. Divisive, yes. But my point with this is that in this movie, the Mad Mickelson's character says something, mm-hmm. and 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 I forget what he says before, but Anna Jones says like you shouldn't have invaded Poland. Like oh yes yes yes. My point about this whole um, this all ties into what I've been saying this whole time mm-hmm. is that it would be cool. To see in the face the amoral gray area that was the Cold War. Mm. But he still sees this world in black and white. Again, not to say that the Nazis were not evil. Mm-hmm. 
the most evil, in fact. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is it's that like, okay, yes, they're evil. And yet your government has been using them mm -hmm. for their own purposes. So how do you feel about that? Like that's so what I, I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Is so when I heard about this premise, that was gonna, and stuff like when I heard that they were gonna kind of use like the moon landing and that and the Nazis and the in the space program as kind of like backdrop for the story, I was like, that's gonna be interesting. How does Indiana Jones feel about Nazis being federal employees of the United States? I, but I, they I, never acknowledge it. I remember you, when you when we first found that out, and you were like, oh, here we go again with more the Nazis. Nazis. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's surprise, surprise, surprise. It's always Nazis. so. That, that's my whole. I, I know that was a long tangent. <laughs> I really should. We really should just do a history podcast. <laughs> But my point with all, I think, I don't think that was a tangent. I think that all supports my claim of like. No, it's true. I think, I think it's interesting it's that like, he we're never. We're still saying like these kind of like cartoonish, like kind of like. He never. World War II Disney that. cartoons, buy war bonds, kind of fight the good fight kind of vision of the world, yeah. which the Cold War complicates. Well, I think. But they I don't think, wrestle with it. I think that would be interesting, right? Uh. You know, and that's, I don't think that's something that ever comes up, right? Him being an employee of the government. Um, well, I mean, they say it because he's part of the, it would be for Indy. He I mean, for Indy. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And confronting that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it, it might also be a strategic thing, right? Because then, like, you would be technically, in a way, criticizing, right? Like, American history, American policies, like, so, but, like... And Disney doesn't want to rock the boat. They're so middle of the road. That's what I'm talking about, cynical, like... Like, like, yeah. that people are literally, like, cheering in the streets because, like, we got a man to the moon. But how do we do that? Oh, with some blood on our hands, like... Oops. Exactly. Not even blood on our hands, but just, like, we... You know, it wasn't like they were in prison. Like, they had homes financed by the government. Like... I know. They were like, put into communities, like, to live normal American lives. I know. And I thought I thought it was so but disrespectful. But other Nazis were sent... Were, were tried but at like, Nuremberg for war crimes. For crimes against humanity. And some left to Argentina. But then others, it's like, okay, well, you're valuable to us, so we'll kind of let all that stuff slide. It yeah. just... It just... It's... it's Indy doesn't want to wrestle with... Well, it's also again, interesting... Again, he can like, look at history from 3,000 years ago, but he doesn't want to wrestle with... Yeah, the history he's perfect. living through. Yeah. And and that's I think my kind of issue with the film is that it just doesn't going back to Lou, the first How thing I said you... when you read the Letterbox blurb, it doesn't really wrestle with him being in a new world that's passed him by because it never they never really address it. In 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 substantive ways, everything is just played for laughs. Like, oh ha, ha his yeah. hippie neighbor's playing magical mystery tour and it woke <laughs> him up. Like it's never actually interesting, critical uh, you know, explorations of these ideas. Yeah. It's just kind of like play for laughs. Like, haha, look, get off my lawn kind of thing. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because he has had strong opinions in the past. So, like, it wouldn't be too far off base. But also, now I'm interested. How but we do... know he's a conservative because he says, I like Ike. Of course. So we know he voted for Dwight D. Eisenhower. Of course. But how did they... How did the Nazis choose to go to the U.S. or the USSR? Like, I think they were captured. Oh, they were captured. They weren't like, like given propositions like, "Hey, we'll pay you this much." I don't know <laughs> enough about Operation Paperclip. <laughs> much has been written and said about it, so but, this is probably you can probably find this out very easily. I don't know oh, the okay. context. Well, now I'm interested because this I would is imagine as as the Allies very strange as the Allies retook certain areas or lands. Yeah. They probably yeah. Took it's them. like they capture a laboratory, uh, and it's like, hey, these guys are working on this. Like, okay, like we're gonna put you in the custody of the CIA of like you know the mm -hmm. intelligence agencies. Yeah. Who then kind of quietly funneled them out and yeah. brought them over to you know wherever it would be. And I I know there were I I and I know I said this while we were watching the movie, and I know there are much more horrible crimes against humanity and and all this stuff, but. I, I just find it very disrespectful that his that his uh Voller's undercover name was Schmidt, right? Isn't that historically Jewish? And and I don't know. It might just be a European or Eastern European thing where a lot of Jewish people lived. Well it just seems So it's it like associated with that, but like I don't know. But it just if it is, it's rude. Because those are mm. the exact people that you're... Yeah. And now you're using them to... Hot. Mm. Yeah. Anywho. Let's see. I don't know enough to be talking about that, but... I have some other notes here. 
All right. Um. Oh, we could also talk about the funny stuff, too. Do you want to save that for the end? Do you want to talk about that? We can that? talk about it now. I like the oh. horse in the subway. I thought it was actually kind of cool. That was silly. <laughs> I was so nervous. I was like, how's he going to get out of this one? Because, like, you know, he's running away. But then, oh. He's running away again. They should have done it as a serial. Like, don't fail to see the next installment. <laughs> Will Indy get out of this jam? <laughs> oh, the poor people just waiting on the platform. Just like... Ah, ah. Also, why is this is this proud, independent black woman? Yes. A fed? Mm-hmm. Mm. I feel like that's... that's that is... That is... Sl- Inappropriate. Too foxy. She's too. She is far too foxy. That's what I'm saying. It's not just because she's 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 a foxy. No, no way. A woman like that, in 1969, is working for the feds. Why would you work for the feds? The CIA. The CIA. Or whoever it in is. In the 60s, as a black woman. Well, didn't they? Didn't the hidden figures people work? For me? Or that was NASA. But, that was NASA. Well, maybe, you know, they're one. In, yeah, they're, I'm just saying, like during like the late again the late 60s, like the black. Liberation, like the the Panthers. And, yeah. What did you know, she... It just seemed. It just seemed kind of. I was like, what? Come what on. What did she say? She was like, oh great, we lost her because you <laughs> trigger happy cracker. You trigger happy cracker. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what the heck? But I didn't understand that. So it's like, so clearly Voler and his kind of cronies have gone rogue, right? But are they with the I CIA, guess. like? Because, like, remember there's the guy who, for some reason, is in crutches? But they never explain, like, why? why I, the, the I honestly of... have no idea. I was confused the entire movie, and I still don't know. Yeah, like, why were they looking for... Why were they keeping an eye on Shaw and, like... Well, because she she was wanted. For what? For selling stolen goods or something. Remember, she, she would, like, sell... At the auction at mm-hmm. the hotel, so I guess. Why would the CIA give a shit? I don't know, cause then there's like the rest of the people there who also selling stuff and buying stuff. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Um, there was a lot of yeah. fogginess going on here. I will say, I liked. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm just so tired. Great. I like bored of our own podcast. I am bored. I'm boring myself talking about ah. the history. Um, <laughs> I will say I liked Phoebe Waller Bridge in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of Fleabag, mm-hmm. um, so I was very interested to see like that character does not fit Indio Jones, mm-hmm. like the Fleabag esque kind of character. Mm-hmm. So I was very interested to see what, how what they were gonna do with her, and I think you know with all of the issues we've brought up, yeah, yeah, yeah. notwithstanding, I, she I think cool. I think she does a good job. Yeah, like she's she's engaging care. Like again. You kind of brought up as not necessarily a negative, but just like an interesting thing that she's kind of like a morally bankrupt kind of person. Like, mm-hmm. I, I found that kind of interesting where she's like not like this kind of like perfect plucky like sidekick. Like yeah, she's like yeah. a little bit more complicated and flawed. And, yeah. Um, no, I thought she was cool. I just yeah. didn't know if I could trust her. But she did. She, she turns out to be she, trustworthy in the end. She's trustworthy and... And... That she won't let him stay in Greece, in, in Sicily. <laughs> yeah. I, I... And, oh, and she also has some good clothes, too. Just like Marion. Very stylish. Oh. I would have liked to see her, Very yeah, and, like, really embracing, yes. like, that late 60s style. Like, again, I wanted to see, like, well, that's Indiana why, Jones that's wearing... That's I was sad when the black lady died. That's what I'm saying, is, like, I would have loved to... She looks so cool in that jacket. They would have really charged the movie with being woke. But, <gasps> like, like, is she should... His... his it should have been a, it should have been like a, a black woman Ooh. as as Helena you know what I mean? yes. um like I was, to really show like the generational really difference where it's like like I yeah. even noticed it just when he's when he's uh teaching his class mm-hmm. also it's kind of cool like he's using a projector now yeah <laughs> um like one of those overhead ones that yeah. they used to use like I remember I remember those in, when I was in, in school no I know yeah 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 Me before too. like smart boards and stuff like that like, use it for math um but I if you notice in that class there are People of not just like not just white students. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you notice whereas in the other Changed ones like from the other ones, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So so it would have been cool again to even if you don't want to engage with it ideologically, mm-hmm. then just dramaturgically mm-hmm. by making his like sidekick a black woman mm-hmm. would just show the generational divide of like yeah. who gets to have agency mm-hmm. in what generation. Well, and then, right? And you then... wouldn't even have to change anything about the script, but doing that would already elevate it. Yeah. Again, yeah. that dramaturgical choice of, of doing that. Yeah. You know? 
I know. I thought she was going to have a bigger role, but then she ended up being evil, and then she ended up being dead. I was disappointed. Who, who the, the black lady? The black lady. But, yeah, I think that would have been cool. And then also, like, if if the goddaughter was, like, black or mixed, then, like, like they could also wrestle with some things in terms of, like, the difference in interactions with people, right? And then that kind of, like, brings him out of his, like, not old ways, but, like, kind of sees things in a different light because she's treated differently than he yeah. is, you know? I don't... You know what? Yeah, this thing is, like, if I were psychoanalyzing Anita Jones, based off of nothing, though, because these movies never touch on race, I don't see him... Like, we talk about him being of a certain era in this, like... I don't see Anita Jones as being racist... I see him as being someone who doesn't understand how hard black people have it. Yeah. So that would be, so like to your Especially point, in the 60s. where it's like oh if his God. partner is a, is a young black woman, mm -hmm. seeing how she is treated or, or sometimes ignored by like, if they're like trying to talk to some guy and like, yeah. he's just ignoring her. Yeah. Or like, like, oh, she can go, she, she's like undercover in this area because like she blends in more. Right. Or as opposed like to like... Like, he, he could see like, firsthand, like, how her experience is different from his. Yeah. So, like, she can't just do what he does. Yeah. Because she doesn't have that luxury. Mm-hmm. Because, like, like, whenever they go to... to Why don't they give me $250 million? <laughs> I know. What are they doing? You know, because, like, obviously he looks... He, you can point him out in a crowd in Morocco or Egypt or anywhere else that they've gone, right? Where she could probably blend in a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. And so they like underestimate her and then she's able to like steal something and then like- well, the, the uh, Reinforcing negative stereotypes. No, 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 like stealing oh. like what you need, you know, what they need oh. to go on their adventure or something. Or stealing the, stealing the item back. Adventure motivated theft. Yes, uh, from the Nazis. Okay, Ste so it's okay. Well, yes. All right. Stealing from Nazis is not stealing. It's always stealing. okay. It's always morally <laughs> permissible. Um, anyway. But yeah, we, I think we have some, some good ideas. Um, that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. All seven of you listening. But um, yeah. But you know who is in this movie? Antonio Banderas? Question mark. As like a semi kind of expand. It's not quite a cameo. Because like he's in multiple scenes. But he, he was never a, he was never a person before, right? Like, no, that was like a new thing. The way they like introduced the character made it seem like it's like a hey, it's this guy you remember. I know the way they do like with Sala. Yeah, and I was like, why is this a big? And then I re I didn't realize it was Antonio Banderas at first, so I had to look it up. Yeah, and I was like, that's why they were like shooting it that way because it's like we're supposed to be like it's Antonio Banderas uh, and not like it's this character you know. I did. It's I this did. actor you. Know. Did not recognize him until you said something. Who yeah. looks like... Well, he's older. I mean, the like, last time I watched this something was like Spy Kids. Well, yeah, he's older, but then also he's like got a, a thick beard. like a thick beard and his hair and everything. So, yeah. um, that was random. Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess they they decided to uh, have him more in it and pay him more than than Sala, right? <laughs> Since um. You know, can't yeah. can't do brown face anymore. So he's like, aww, <laughs> he's like, aww man, he's like, what I, do you mean? I also brought my passport. I can go with you. Yeah, he was like, please let me go. <laughs> Which I thought would have been. And cute. it's not racist for me to be doing this accent because I'm impersonating a British guy doing a fake accent. <laughs> what? Okay. Oh, so he's singing the song he sang in the first one. It is the spirit <laughs> of the sea. Um, <laughs> they're digging in the wrong spot. They're digging in the wrong place. They're digging in the wrong place. Um, um, yeah. So I guess that was that was a little callback, but not too much. And then kind of shifted. It's what to... South Park calls the member berries. Member berries. Um, I think this. I think they started doing this that plot thread. Right around the time The Force Awakens was coming out. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's like nostalgia bait. Where it's just yeah, like... Yeah, yeah, It'll just be like, remember this? Yes, of course, of course. Um, but I'm saying instead of paying him more to be in more scenes and whatnot, because it's... I mean, it, you could probably, you know, with good good argument, you know, say that it's kind of problematic of him doing that. Yeah. You know, even if he's not in brown face or not doing an accent or whatever. But... um you know, and, and switching that out with it. five yeah. minutes of Antonio I, and then killing him. But I, that's where they do killing kill him. Killing Antonio 
Antonio but Banderas. With, with Sal, I don't know what would be worse. Giving him brown face? <laughs> or not giving him brown face? But insisting that this pasty white man is an Egyptian man. No, oh, he could just go to the beach and tan. <laughs> I swear. That's like brown face, though. That's like you're, you're... tanning. No, but you're you're I'm... actively trying to change it to make it seem like a different race. Well, well, no, it would just aid in the in the anyway visual. But... So Harrison Ford sometimes accused of not giving a shit. Of course, he'll be in movies literally just for the paycheck. Of course. Um, and the thing about those accusations is that ninety nine percent of the time they're true. <laughs> Indiana Jones seems to be like the only role he like has ever actually cared about. When people ask him about Han Solo, he's like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. And Ian Jones, he seems to care about, mm. actually. I would say he's, like, the the material doesn't really give him the room for it, but, like, there's some, he's, like, actually acting sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, like, the scene when they're on the boat and she's at, and she's asking him about his son and stuff, and he's talking mm-hmm. about, you know, like, basically that's what drove him and Mary in a par and yeah. stuff. And, like, you can see Harrison Ford, like, actually acting. Mm-hmm. It's just that the film doesn't really afford him a lot of opportunities like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is trying. Because he misses his wife and son. Yeah. You know. That's so sad. Speaking of his wife, I wish there was more Marion. I know. I liked her in this. It wasn't just a, a remember remember this person. Because she's fucking awesome. Her little scene was great. I was I like, oh, she's a good, Karen. I like Karen Allen. She has like a good, they have, they've always had good chemistry. I know. I don't know why she was not in it a lot, but at least but she was sorry, in it, it was... a little, I guess. It was just, it was kind of ruined though, that last scene, because I was like, because the last time they had this conversation, because they do a throwback to like, everything hurts, and he's like, but, and then she's kissing him. Yes. Like, the last time they, they they did that, they had sex. Yes. So now I'm just practicing these two bag, old bag of bones, <laughs> you know, shacking up. That's what they were doing, and then he grabs his hat. Because he's like, I have to wear my hat. The hat stays on. <laughs> the hat stays on. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but <laughs> if you ever wear a hat, I do, well, I don't have a penis, so I don't know what this I, is true. <laughs> um, <sighs> do I need some trivia? I, I've really given a lot of myself for this for this episode. I didn't think I would. I, I thought this one would be a pretty non. Why are you so spent? <laughs> I don't know. I, well, because I think there's a lot to talk about that's not here. Does that make sense? What, like, what could be? Yeah. And I feel yeah. like it, this movie is more frustrating than anything. We've had, we've been very critical, but that being said, I actually thought it was decent. Like, I thought it was good. Yeah, I thought But I, I did not it. hate this movie by any means. Yeah, I liked it. And I actually liked a lot about it. So, why don't we just say, quick, like, I actually kind of liked the time travel, like, how they end up doing, like, mm-hmm. like, basically the bait and switch is like, they, while they're about to fly into this portal, Indy realizes, wait, the calculations are wrong because Archimedes couldn't have possibly known about continental drift. Yes. So when they fly into this fissure, it's not 1939, but like 214 BC. It's like the <laughs> Roman invasion of Syracuse. <laughs> but that's really interesting, right? I've always liked the ideas of like I time, like, that was funny. like expansive time travel, like when it's like hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I just thought it was funny because it thwarted the Nazis' plans. So. It did, but it's, it's kind of cool because then they're like, what, what they see the plane, they're like, look at that dragon in the yeah, sky. Yeah, they like, see it's a dragon. And they're like shooting harpoons at it, and then in return the Nazis are like shooting Bro, bullets at it. It was those cool, some right? Big-ass arrows. <laughs> yeah. Those some big-ass arrows. Those are more like harpoons oh, than arrows. I don't know what they were, but they were large. Um, <sighs> yeah. And also the whole time, Indy is like, Bleeding out? Yeah. <laughs> they just don't address that. He got shot in the shoulder. And he's just like yeah. bleeding for like yeah. two hours. But, but um, no, I liked, I, I liked that. Again, if people are like, it's so ridiculous. Like, it's as ridiculous as anything in this franchise has been. It's I, kind of ridiculous, but also I, I kind of like it. I, if it's I, not ridiculous, it's not an Indiana Jones movie. That's my take. I, I like that it wasn't like a modern time. Like, that was funny. You know. That's where I thought they were going. It's like, okay, so then we're going to see him running around in the late 30s again, <laughs> fighting Nazis again. But I really like that. Sub- I did not, that, that wasn't spoiled from, I did not know that going into this movie. Yeah, yeah. That that was going to be where they end up. Um, yeah. But I'm also confused because he was like, oh, this is the only place that it goes to. So did Ar- 
so they're saying that Archimedes only made a time travel thing to go back before the siege on Syracuse. And furthermore, does the dial create the fissure or does the dial just detect the fissures? Yeah, is it like Donnie Darko? Is it like Donnie Darko where it's just like, hey, this is going to happen and here, here is where it is? I don't know. That's a good question. It's like a giant butthole in the sky. I guess um, so. Oh my gosh. And also, how, do, how does Teddy know how to fly a plane? First of all. Second of all, I thought it was so silly. He had that random Italian man in the back. Well, not random. He's the owner of the plane. But that was... He was like... <laughs> the hijinks. Mamma mia! I know. And they... <laughs> and, like, Teddy speaks French. This guy speaks Italian. Like... It... <laughs> there were there were lots of hijinks. And, um... So... He was probably like, So, this is awkward. <laughs> Uh, there were hijinks. But also... Hijinks and low jinks. I'm still, I'm still caught up on Baller. How is that man alive? He was on oh, the, the side of a prologue, train. He like got like whacked by almost like went, hereditary <laughs> style. And, like, <laughs> like a giant ass metal pole. Yeah. On a moving train. Onto Going the like ground. 30, 50 miles an hour or something. <laughs> onto the ground. And it was like in elevated the track, of, so he probably fell like a story. Or in so. the middle of nowhere I in nineteen forty. I thought they were gonna answer that, like maybe like he is actually a different version of him that has traveled forward in time. Oh. Like I, I thought maybe there was gonna be some but nope, they never explained. I thought it was so random. I thought it was gonna be a different guy or like he wasn't gonna die and then it was it would be the same guy, but I, I guess it was the same mm. guy and he didn't die, but but I meant like not have the possibility of dying. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like it would have been a random Nazi to get thunked, right? Random Nazi. Oh, I thought it was funny when she was climbing up in the plane and the guy was like, I don't know, falling out or whatever. And she was like, sorry, dude, I would help you, but you're a Nazi, so. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, though, same, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I would never. Anyway, do you want to hear some trivia? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I would I, I, I would like to think that I would save someone no matter what, but I don't know. Anyway. It's challenging. Harrison Ford would embark on 40-mile bike rides and daily walks to get in shape for his Indiana Jones role. Jesus Christ. He's better. He's probably in better shape than me. Yeah, he's in better shape than both of us. Um, Harrison, Like I said before, Harrison Ford was paid $20 million for this film. Well, do you... Do you That's probably why it's so expensive. That it costs so much money because of like the salaries yeah. and stuff. Like, well, yeah, that's why I was saying is like, like with the I don't know his real name, but Sala and Antonio. It's like, are yeah. are they saving money or are they just racking up a bill? Like, I feel like yeah. Antonio can also like you know get a lot of money. Again, it makes like, you wonder: is Hollywood just a big money laundering scheme? Because, again. The new Godzilla movie was Mm -hmm. made for about fifteen million dollars, and a lot of that's also because they have like really backwards labor laws. The people who worked on it probably weren't paid a lot. Mm -hmm. But even if you were like to double it, that's thirty million dollars compared to this two thirty eight. And that one looks that looks so great VFX wise. (laughs) I didn't. This one costs over two hundred million dollars, and it looks like shit. I didn't. It's you literally. You're literally the first note you brought up was like it just looked. It just looked weird. Well, okay, I thought the de-aging, it didn't look as strange as I thought it was going to be, but, like, I did still see it. And then also when they were in Syracuse, like, you could, like, see the king. Yeah, like, there was some stuff, on, yeah, like, on it, their it, hair. Looked, it looked really bad when they're, like, after, when they meet Archimedes and she's, but she's trying to get Indy to go in, like, it, it, that was very green screen. Yeah. Probably because it was a reshoot that they did very mm. hastily. Mm. See, reshoots are so much easier now. Because yeah. back then, if you need to reshoot, you have to go to that location again. <laughs> but now, yeah. they it's just like you just go down the street to the yeah. green, to the studio or whatever. Right? Right. Um, I mean, there was no green or anything, but it's like, you can as just someone tell who that knows. The like, human you know, eye can, you can just tell that like, you can just they tell don't. That the, that the hair is not really yeah. in front of the yeah. Sky, you know. Though Disney CEO 
Mm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, the Disney CEO, Robert A. Iger. I don't know why the trivia wrote it. Bob Iger. <laughs> Although he stated in 2016 that the film would not be the last in the series, Disney confirmed in April 2023, before the film came out, mind you, that it would indeed be the last film following the cancellation of a planned spinoff prequel series the previous month. Probably because they watched the finished movie and were like, yeah, this is going to be it. Yeah, this I is not going to inspire like a new wave of Indiana Jones. I'm not there's, yeah, I'm not sure there's much else you could do with the character. I mean, they had the little... Well, they, they could do a prequel show. There was already a prequel well, show called did. The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Yeah, didn't they? I yes, I in the 90s. How, I don't know how well that did, but, you know, there was that. But it was a prolific show. Like, it know. was on for like four or five seasons. Oh, well, great. So, see... I, already, there's already a prequel show. There, there's a prequel show. There's a now shows and movies. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's much more to do. It's, Again, it was never a character. I feel like you just do too much at that point. Like, yeah. yes. it's like it's like Iron Man. You just gotta kill him eventually. Mm-hmm. He's been in stuff I, since two thousand eight. Um, John Williams has stated <laughs> that a new. <sighs> oh my god! <sighs> I'm so tired today. I'm sorry. Maybe we shouldn't be recording at night. No, no, it's because I ran on my Adderall and my psychiatrist hasn't responded. They haven't refilled it, so I have to use. Uh, Concerta, mm. which is not as effective. Mm. So I am muy sleepio. Slepito? <laughs> um, Cansada. John Williams has stated that a new ending had to be shot and that he therefore needed to compose a new score for it. However, James Mangold denied any reshot ending. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's it's weird. very apparent. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier drafts of the script had many more jokes about the age of Indiana Jones in it than what appears in the finished film. Star Star Harrison Ford took issue with them. I love that they put Star. Like, I don't know if you know who Harrison Ford is. He's the star of the movie. He took issue with them, believing that they were distracting from the story for the audience. As such, the number of age gags was considerably reduced to many fewer. I mean, Mutt made jokes. That was like every other line was Mutt being like, hey, old man. Yeah, like... And he was all like, Indiana Jones was all, he was only like 50 or 55 or 60 years old. <laughs> Harrison Ford was 80 at the time of this film's release. Really? Two weeks shy of his 81st birthday, making him the oldest person to play the lead in a Disney film. Wow. This is the first and only Indiana Jones film to be shot digitally on Ari, Alexa, LF, and Mini LF cameras instead of on 35mm film. Uh, can you do it back again? <laughs> do what? what? Can you shoot it again on 35mm? I mean, <laughs> well. Thank you for your efforts. The- what do you say? But um, can you shoot it well this time. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing: is that it, it, digital photography can look really good. This doesn't look good though. It's not. It's not that it's inherently worse. It's just you just need to know how to use it. Yeah. Anyway, the Antikythera mechanism is a real artifact, an incredibly advanced ancient relic, considering to be the first analog computer ever devised, mm-hmm. with a complex set of dials and internal gears, whose purpose was an automatic astrolab. Um, an astrolab is a flat manual device with movable dials and pointers that accurately plots the course of planets, the sun, the moon, and its phases and eclipses. Invented around 200 BC, shortly after the death of Archimedes at the siege of Syracuse, and likely based on his invention of the planetarium, a multi-layered sphere with light perforations mm. that projects the same celestial movements. The automatic mechanism discovered on the Greek island Antikythera, which is where it gets its name, in 1902, was built by an unknown inventor around 100 BC. The time travel purpose is, of course, fictional for the movie. He didn't even make this. Well, we don't know. He didn't even As make it. As I'm learning, it. watching a lot of... I've been watching this historian talk about, like, the historical basis of, like, the Bible and Jesus and all these things. It It's a lot... Of, we really don't know. Well, you, you can't know, say what, he didn't, but we can't say he did either. Was he... Did he even go to Ecotheria? Was he no. even anywhere? No, he probably there? didn't, because they said it was probably made around 100 BC. And yeah, was yeah, like that was much. That was I much know. later. And also, I don't think he would have had time to be making the the Antikytheria and to make this elaborate thing to his tomb that goes into a different thing. And he's wearing the watch. And he's wearing a Nazi's watch, and it's a, how he made all these traps and puzzles and shit. For his own tomb? Yeah, what? I never understood, like, why why they're so elaborate about it. What? <laughs> um, in all these kinds of movies, it's always so elaborate. Which is which is fine, which I'm sure, you know, like... Have the- we ever found anything historical like this of any kind of, like, complex 
way to find like have any artifacts ever been found by solving some set of complex puzzles has that ever well, happened in the history well, yeah national treasure that's not real but but it's based on real stuff like freemasons and whatnot you but know? have we ever actually found have, has there ever been an instance of uncovering a, an artifact behind a set of complex physical puzzles I don't know what they do. Anyway, Indy identifies the ship to shore battle as the famous siege of Syracuse, which he says means they had traveled back to 214 BC. The initial siege from ships took place in 213 213 BC. The subsequent land siege took place in 212. So why did they get this wrong? (laughs) If this is common knowledge, why did James Mangold give the wrong here? (laughs) Is it Mangold's fault? (laughs) So whoever wrote it, whoever wrote that line, anyway. James Mangold said his original title for this when he pitched the films was Indiana Jones and the Magical Mystery Tour. Oh, based off the song. It probably wasn't going to be the real, but I think just like to kind of give like the vibe of, you know, whatever. I never heard that song before. Um, The Magical Mystery Tour. No, they go, uh, they roll up to the mystery tour. <laughs> you never heard Magical Mystery Tour? No, there's, I mean, there's The so... Magical Mystery Tour is dying to take you away. <laughs> what does that even mean? I don't know. It's like this weird psychedelic song that they oh, were doing so in like the late 60s. Oh, so they were on drugs. 60s. Okay. No, there's so, there's, their discography is like so vast. It's like, I didn't, mm. I didn't even know about like a lot of songs until I was like in middle mm. school. Anyhow. So... I heard this really cool new song called Here Comes the Sun. Have you heard it? <laughs> Have you heard it before? No, like I didn't know about the walrus one or the. That's sh- from the same album as Magical Straub- Mystery Tour. Or the strawberry. That's also fields. from Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> okay, These so- all weird, like that was like their weird so psychedelic. I album. was not familiar with their drug era. However, I was familiar. Well, with other I'm not things. saying they were on drugs. It was just very uh, reflective of Lucy the- in the Sky with Diamonds. Explicitly LSD. The longest Indiana. I'm moving on. The longest Indiana Jones film at two hours and thirty four minutes. Which one is it? This one? This is the longest one. <laughs> it just says, the longest. The, <laughs> not, why would I be talking about not, another This one? is the longest. Anywho. In no, the I scene, know. I was just being funny. In the scene in Syracuse where Teddy pickpockets a Taurus child, the child is watching a puppet show that depicts a dragon breathing fire on a Roman warrior. This foreshadows future events where the German plane opens fire on Roman warriors and the warriors refer to the plane as a dragon. Oh. A little foreshadow. I didn't get that. But why why were they... Maybe because it's kind of like this was a story passed down. Mm. Like at the siege of Syracuse, this dragon flew. Uh, So you're telling the story, but in actuality, it was just like a... a Oh, I gotcha, I gotcha. I thought it was weird. They were like bullying him from afar. Yeah, they were like, get out of here. They're like, look at that kid with his hat. Look at that kid with his unibrow. He's like... He just had a straw hat. He's like, what? (laughs) What do you care? Anyway. You're a child in a blazer. (laughs) (laughs) This is the only Indiana Jones movie where he actually gets to keep the artifact he goes to so much trouble to find. Does he? Yeah, at the end, they have the, he has the dial in his room. Oh, yes, and he also has the, uh, the harpoon, too. Yeah. In the first scene that takes place in 1969, the camera moves across Indiana's apartment. On the shelf, there, um, on the shelf there is a picture of his son next to a folded U.S. flag that is given to families of fallen veterans. So this is the first clue of the military career and the subsequent death of his son, which is confirmed later in the movie when Indiana mentions it to Helena on the boat. I did notice that, like the, the folded flag. In oh, the I did not notice that. I noticed the socks hanging. I thought maybe it was given to him because of his service in World War II. Uh, but then I, yeah, I guess they only give out that that one. Yeah, the, when someone the triangle dies. Yeah. fold. Oh, I did not see that. Hmm. Um, the original ending had the time travelers go back to 1939. So they was the original. They were originally gonna yes, do that. Yes, yes. Now, I don't know if that was the original one they shot and then had to reshoot, mm. or if that was just like in, the, in an earlier draft. Mm. But it was gonna go back to 1939 with Indiana Jones put into the difficult position of trying to save Adolf Hitler from Voller killing him. <laughs> just like I have to. That's like the there's a Family Guy yeah. story arc, which they rarely do. But there was like a two part. Maybe it was only one part, but there was a Family Guy thing where they go back in time mm-hmm. to prevent 9/11 from happening. Oh my god. But then it makes, like, the future horrible. Mm. So it's like, we have to go back in time and make 9-11 happen. Oh, my God. (laughs) So so this is like that, where it's like, I have to make sure he doesn't kill Hitler. Oh, my God. (laughs) Um, 
the logo. This is what this next trivia bit is just one of those that really is not relevant at all, but it's just funny that someone took the time to write this on the IMDb trivia page for this film. <laughs> okay. The logo on grocery bags Marion brings to Indy's apartment belongs to Grand Union Supermarkets, a chain that had stores throughout the northeastern United States and the Caribbean in its heyday. Following several bankruptcies and changes in ownership throughout its history, the Grand Union brand was discontinued in 2013 but revived eight years later. As of early June, July 2023, the chain had 10 stores in New York State and one in Vermont. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you. You know who probably wrote this? Whoever was the CEO of Grand Union Supermarkets. They're like, we gotta, we gotta put this in. That's so random. Um, at the end of the film, it is implied that Indy has been cleared in the killing of his two colleagues since their deaths were no longer mentioned after the events in Tangier. Yeah, I don't. He's basically framed for murder because the evil guys kill like two of the people at the university. I don't understand at all because like, uh, was he was he only framed because he was the only person that they knew? Like they because didn't... he calls, he's like, I'm at the oh, my name. There's people dead at the university. I don't know. Some people will do that. They'll call and confess their own. Like they'll call the police about their own murder. That happens. Uh... People are like I just shot my husband. I'm at this address. Why? I don't know. Anyway. Oh, well, anyways, I was confused about that, but that's good. He's not wanted for murder anymore. Phew! Even though... I don't know what it'd be like to be an 80-year-old. Confirmed going. murderer. Yeah, he's murdered plenty of other people. Also, Teddy, confirmed murderer. Yeah, Teddy does kill one of them. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about critical reception? Sure. Let's wrap this thing up. I'm getting sleepy. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just getting started. Anyway, so in terms of the contemporary reaction, aka six months ago, because we're recording this in January. Um, right, I was getting confused because when I think contemporary, I think modern. Technically, contemporary means of the time period. Mm. So when I say contemporary, but I'm talking about a film from the 60s, it sounds mm. wrong. But what I mean is people in the 60s, what did they say in the 60s? Mm. Mm -hmm. But contemporary sounds like I mean modern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not what it means because content, like with the time. Mm. That's what that word, that's the root of all those. Mm -hmm, right. mm -hmm. um, Ron Tomatoes has a 69%, not as low as I thought it would be. Mm. Um, the critical consensus is, quote, It isn't as thrilling as earlier adventures, but the nostalgic rush of seeing Harrison Ford back in action helps Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny find a few final bits of cinematic treasure. End quote. John Nugget, <laughs> just kidding, John Nugent <laughs> of Empire Magazine gave the film four out of five stars. Mm. Complimenting Ford's performance and noted Nangold's camera work, quote, moves confidently through action set piece after action set piece, keeping up a frantic pace, end quote. Mm. Yeah. Bilge <laughs> Abiri, reviewing for Vulture, called the film, quote, fun, end quote. But acknowledged <laughs> comparisons to the previous installments were, quote, warranted. But it's also too entertaining to dismiss. You may not lose yourself in this one the way so many of us once did with the earlier Indiana Jones films, but you'll certainly have a good time. Yes. Um, the Guardian's Peter Bradshaw felt Dial of Destiny, quote, has quite a bit of zip and fun <laughs> and narrative ingenuity with all of its MacGuffin-y silliness that the last one really did, end quote. <laughs> so it seems like the reviews are not awful by any means. Yeah. Um, Owen Gleiberman of Variety described the film as a, quote, dutiful, dutifully eager, but ultimately rather joyless piece of nostalgic hokum minus the thrill though it has its quota of relentless action it rarely tries to match let alone top the indeed the ingeniously staged kinetic brav bravura of Razor of lost ark time travel in indiana jones of the dial of destiny is really an unconscious metaphor since it's the movie that it's the movie that wants to go back in time completing our love affair with the defining action movie star role of harrison ford in the abstract, at least, it accomplishes that, right down to the emotional diagram of a touching finale, but only by reminding you that even if you restage the action ethos of the past, recapturing the thrill is much harder, end quote. Very interesting kind of critical read on that, where it's like, Whoa. it's the movie that kind of wants to time travel, in a sense, that it's like stuck in the past. Which is, really which is true. Think. That's what legacy things do, you know? I know. To their detriment, ultimately. Mm. Um, David Rooney for The Hollywood Reporter criticized the film, writing, quote, It's a big bombastic movie that goes through the motions but never finds much joy in the process. Despite John Williams' hard-working score continuously pushing our nostalgia buttons and trying to convince us we're on a wild ride. John! Because it's pulling, like, all those old themes from the... And I remember yes. in the subtitles it would say, like, Marion's theme, and you were like, Marion's theme! <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of modern reception, on Letterboxd has a 3.0 out of 5. So, pretty mixed, Kind of right down the middle. Um, here are some Letterboxd reviews as we do. Parston, 
writes, quote, Harrison Ford is one of the oldest guys. <laughs> this is true. This is true, Carson. <laughs> Tyler writes, quote, sometimes all you really need is the comforting on-screen presence of Indiana Jones punching Nazis. Of course. Of course. And then Patrick Willems writes, quote, I didn't have a bad time, but I will also probably never watch this again and forget everything about it by the end of the week. <laughs> That's me, I think. That's exactly how I feel, where it's like, I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's mediocre. I think it's a net positive. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm going to forget most of it by next week. It's just kind of whatever. I don't know. Well, well like, uh, what was his name? Owen. Like Owen said, it, it, it is difficult to, you know, draw, drawing you back in. Like, like, there's a reason why people like love those because they were original. Yeah. That's, a, that's what stu- I don't understand is that studios are always like, we have to lean on this and intellectual engaging. eye. No, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's it's good, but also like, they're like, oh, you can't make something original. It's like, you could. In fact, all the things that you're like continuing were once original. Mm-hmm. So like, it just, you just need to, it just requires creativity <laughs> and taking chances yeah. on creating new things and they may not always work out but they just want bankable like this is gonna make this like yeah. the, the film industry entertainment is not a reliable if you wanna make money go invest do investment banking mm-hmm. like this is not a good industry because so much of it is based off of people like it's so fickle you mm-hmm. cannot bank on anything yeah you know in terms of the legacy, I talked about this a little bit, but by November 2022, Disney considered multiple options to continue the franchise, including additional films or television series no. for Disney+. Plus. But by March of the next year in 2023, Lucasfilm was reported to have canceled the Planet Indiana Jones prequel series to focus instead on the Star Wars franchise. It would have been the second prequel sil- uh, sil- sil- series <laughs> following the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, which I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Disney confirmed the following month that the film would indeed be the last in the franchise. You know, I, I don't think it should continue, but... And I don't know if she would be into this, but I think Phoebe could have a little spinoff show. No way, no way it'll happen because no, no, not that people it were could. like, oh, they're trying to, they're trying to give any, make Indiana Jones pass on the mantle to this girl. No, I know, I know, not like in actuality. I'm just saying, like, I, I think that could be good. She was like an engaging <laughs> character. She was fun, right? You know. Yeah, maybe, maybe a well, maybe a a schlocky tie-in novel. <laughs> what? Talk about her continuing adventures in the mid seventies. <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe some fanfic will be written, and then we could write a fanfic, and then they'll adapt it from there. Maybe. Favorite part. Mm. Uh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you go. I have to think. Um. I I will say I liked the plot twist of them going back to, like, Roman times. Mm-hmm. I might say that. They don't really do enough with it, but I think there's that initial kind of, like, delight of that twist. Like, mm-hmm. wait, like realizing where they are. Because, mm-hmm. again, I was not expecting it, and I had not had that spoiled for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that was pretty great. Um, if not that, I liked him riding a horse in the subway. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to say, although I, I know it seems weird to say, but I think I'm going to say kind of like you never say the, weird things, though, so the kind of like throwback elements of it. Right. So like the, the map, you know, yes, the map that, animation. Yeah. And like, um, I don't you like know. The, you like those member berries. Yeah. I do like the member berries. Okay. One to ten. What are you giving this movie? And and keep in mind, we're not putting it in the ranking. I'm gonna give it um, a seven. A seven? Okay. Yeah. I think it's. I think it's good. I think it's fun. Um, not perfect. Not necessarily. A what I thought, or B what I would have wanted, but I think it, it's it's this third other thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm gonna give it a six. I think it's okay. I, I, when I went into this episode, like when we first started recording, I had in my mind I was going to give it a seven. Mm-hmm. But as we talked about it more, I was like, it's a six. Mm. If it were to be a seven, it would have been a very low seven. I feel like the now, only reason that we're like more critical of it is because like we ex- not expect it, but like have the idea that it 
it has the capacity to be like better. It falls short of potential. Right, you know? So, like, some of the, like, some of the movies that, like, we'll talk about, and they're, like, like, super short episodes, and it's like, oh, well, not really sure what else to say, because it's like, we're not really sure what kind of things, you know, could be done with the material, but, like, with this, we'll talk a lot about of, like, what was done and then what also could have been done in order to build on what we know yeah. about the character and, yeah. and story and whatnot. So, um, I don't, at least, at least in this situation, I think it's a, it's a good faith, um, discussion or, or yeah. criticism, you know, it's not, I didn't hate it, you know, it doesn't make me want to poke my eye with a fork. Right? <laughs> like, it's good, but it, we know that yeah. it's, like, it could be something else, you know? Yeah. I've never liked the argument of, like, oh, like, you can't judge it for what it's not. You have to judge what it is. I'm like, that makes no sense. Mm. I think you absolutely can judge something for what it's not. Because if it's, if it's, like, if me there's a difference between me wanting them to lean in certain political things the difference between that and me going into a horror movie and wanting it to be a comedy like uh, that's different what? but some would say it's the same thing like you're you're you're, you're criticizing it for what it's not mm -hmm. but the pro problem here is that like i'm i'm criticizing it for what it's not because like there are the seeds there yes that's the thing where it's like you, you've laid the seeds or the groundwork mm -hmm. for it to be something that it ends up not being. Yeah. That's the difference. I'm not going into movies and not liking them because they're not what I wanted mm -hmm. on a pure conceptual level. Whereas, like, when there are no seeds, then it really is about what it is, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's like, okay, well, I don't really have yeah, much like, to say on it. It so is what it is. I think it's totally fair to kind of judge this for how it falls short of what it could have been. Yeah. Um, so I always feel weird about that. It's like, like we're not, you know, shitting yeah. on these movies or saying that we could do any better or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I I've heard some of that talk from some people and like, you know, like, oh, why are you being so negative or whatever? It's like People criticizing our show? Not our show. If you're listening. <laughs> not our show. Anyway. So I I just want to make that clear that it's I think we're more critical because we love it. No, you it's the, the thing about being about looking at things with a critical lens. Critical doesn't mean negative. Yeah. It just means well, with it like seems a close negative lens. To yeah. A lot of people. Critical like if you really just want to be technical, like it literally just means like looking at something with like a little bit more attention mm -hmm. to it. Um and if anything it elevates, you know, like, if you don't care about movies or storytelling, you're not mm. going to be critical because it doesn't matter to you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I made this analogy many times before, I but think, it's like food. I think that's important. Like, yeah. I'm not critical of food mm -hmm. in the sense, like, I'm, or in terms of being, in terms of attention to detail, like, about, oh, different, I'm getting notes of certain flavors and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I like what I like and I don't like what I don't like. Mm -hmm. Right? And some people, that's like, that's like what movies are for them. Yeah. Right? Whereas our kind of job here on the show, mm -hmm. as well as just viewers, and even if we didn't do the show, is to, you know, hold the medium to a higher standard because of it, because it has the potential to be, you know. Like I always say, like, learning about movies more, yes, and people always say, like, oh, it makes you, like, not like movies. Mm -hmm. That's only half true. It makes you, like, if it was a movie that you didn't like before, now you really don't like it. Mm -hmm. But movies that you liked, now you love. Yeah. Like it makes you it makes you be it makes you able to appreciate the things that are working. It makes you able to appreciate them really really a lot a lot more. Yeah. So, you know, I think I think that's that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So don't let any don't let the hoes bring you down. <laughs> the hoes, the okay. haters. Um it's time for bed. That's it for this okay. bonus episode. Oh no, that's what I call a franchise. We'll do Ooh. another. We'll do another bonus episode in a few months. But for now, Viviana, where can they find us? Of course, you guys can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Franchise Podcast. I've also added this in. Oh, if you have the time, leave a rating for us on Apple Podcasts because apparently that helps. And if you and if you have even more time, leave us a review too. 
That was the first time Viviana ever heard. I told you the script was new. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that I changed the format of the scripts. Um, but I think for Batman, they're still the old one. Mm. But I wrote this outline after. Mm-hmm. So you're never, you're not going to hear us say this again for a while. <laughs> but please leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Write a review if you can. <laughs> Because I guess it helps with, like, the of people course, discovering it. Of course, it um, does. We do have one review on Apple Podcasts, but it's just from your friend, Olivia. Woo! If you're listening, Olivia. If you still listen. I don't know if you still listen. Thank you, Olivia. Um, we know you have many podcasting options, and we thank you for choosing us. Peace out, guys. Bye. Later, Gators. Bye.